Warning, if you are faint of heart or easily offended, this show is not for you. So, okay, Alec, let's talk about the hand. The hand, okay? Let's do it. Arms up. I'm going to preface something here first. I want to preface it. So here's the thing. Six years ago, yeah? Yeah. Six years ago when the controversy happened with the hand. Well, the thing is the hand happened a year before the controversy, so I'm trying to think if it was six or seven. But anyway, yeah, I get what you're saying. Oh, because it didn't air? No, it aired. It just, the controversy arose from what people in poker making videos about it. Oh, and so, okay. But why did it take a year? I don't know. That's a okay. good question. That I didn't know. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Okay, welcome to the Nick Fertucci Show. I am Nick Fertucci, and I am here with Alec Torelli. Hey, Alec, guys. Hey. Thanks for being here, man. Thank you for doing this. This yeah, is cool. Yeah, You've been, uh, we'll talk about it a little later, but you've been playing a little bit uh, at The Hustler. Yeah. You've been playing on the streams, yeah. It's been fun. You've had some big days and some bad days. I know I've had days where I was the single biggest winner and then the single biggest loser. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, you know, in between, but that's that's poker, and I think... yeah. You know, with my style too, like it's maybe going to be a little bit more. Well, we'll talk about that. Yeah. I want to know what you call your style and, mm -hmm. and why you have those kind of swings. But how, what we're going to do, how how I see this going, if you're okay with it, let's bang out some of your personal stuff, like about you and your personal life. I have some notes here that I gathered from myself and from you, and then we'll go into your poker career. Which even myself, as I looked it up, I was pretty impressed. I didn't know a few of these things that that that. Uh, I have here and so we'll talk about all that. I think it's interesting and then we will talk about The hand all okay? right, and we'll get to that and then we'll close out with some just a few uh, Easy questions and some final thoughts and we'll wrap it. Yep. That sound like a good thing. Sounds to you? like a good all right, show we'll do Let's it. do it. All right So you just recently you told me a couple minutes ago. You just had your 10-year anniversary with your wife Yeah, 10 years married. It was uh, it was yesterday. So oh wow. Nice. Yeah, what'd was... you do? We um, we had loose plans that got changed. We went to Dana Point, went to a place we love for lunch, like a health what food it? store. Oh, health food? Organic tree or something. It's like a health food place, like right on the harbor. Is that why you drink? No, it's not Earth, um, but it's a really good place. And then we went to a nice hotel called the Waldorf, uh, nice. right in Dana Point, like on the water and just did you have, there. Did you get a room? No, we didn't. We oh. just hung out there for the day. Nice. Um, it was beautiful. Like just an awesome day. Cool. Very us, I, I would say. Is that why you drink uh, lukewarm water because it's better for you? <laughs> I actually. So the first time I was traveling through Asia, this was, oh man, 2007. It's been a while, and I was on a layover in Singapore, and I asked. I was at the lounge. I asked the guy for a water, and he gives me this water, and it's like warm, and I was like, you know. I was kind of taken aback because I've never had warm water yeah. before. And obviously in the U S everything comes with ice. And so I was asking him, I was like, Hey, like, did you make a mistake? Or like, what, why is the water warm? And he was explaining to me like the whole ritual behind it, that it's, you know, your body's warm you need to drink warm water and like all this stuff, the cold water, the ice is actually bad for you to digest, whatever. And so I tried it and I was like, okay, maybe I don't like it warm. But then from that, I started drinking, I was in Asia for a while and then like all the water is room yeah. temp. And so I got used to room temp water and it's actually easier to drink more water if it's room temp. Well, this is really weird because everything that I've ever drink, I have to have extra ice, right? And just literally three weeks ago, not bullshitting you, three weeks ago, and I, where was I? I was somewhere and they were, it was a health thing where I was learning a bunch of stuff and I heard just that, that you're supposed to drink warmer water, not cold. It's better for your system. Actually, the cold is reverse bad, like you said. And so I've been doing that and you can drink more. And so it's I've been, easier to consume. yeah, it's easier to consume, but, but I will say, and I'm still going to say it every once in a while when I grab that cold bottle and I drink it, oh, is it good? Yeah. Drink? It's but, almost like a treat. And it's not like I'm doing this for health yeah. reasons. I'm not like that much of a health nut where I'm like, yeah. I have well, to Well, you're going to eat at health stores. I, yeah. Drinking, I would say I'm on you're the, drinking warm water. I'm, yeah. I would say yeah. most people would consider me healthy, but I'm, I actually just prefer it at this point. There are still times when I mix, like I mix electrolytes and water, like element. I, yeah. I drink that. I like it with ice because it's like a drink and I, and I love it. Yeah. Got so it. I do it occasionally. All right. So, 
uh, from what I know about you, you, and I know this because you told me this a couple weeks ago, you met your wife in Italy. Yes. And you were trying to figure out how to learn the language, and she is who you bumped into? Is that yeah, accurate? Yeah, it's, it's quite serendipitous. I um, was... 24 at the time and I was you know living in Vegas living this fast life I was like playing all the big poker and whatever and I wanted a break like my grandma had just passed away and one of the things on my bucket list was go to Italy and move, learn Italian that was like yeah. the top of the things I wanted to do I made a list of 30 things I wanted to do by 30 and so I was like okay my grandma just died kind of shook me and so I went to Italy and um I read about this book uh, I read, sorry, I read about this town in a book called Playing for Pizza, and it was a town called Padma, and so I um, went there because I wanted to, like, explore it, and while I was there, I was like, you know what, maybe I'm going to stay here, I was kind of exploring where I wanted to stay, and I walked into the university, and I was looking for a place to learn Italian, so I went to the university, and I, I walked into the first office I saw, and I was like, hey, I'm here, and I explained my situation, and the person that was in that office was Ambra, and wow. yeah, we what? started, like, exchanging, uh, we exchanged emails at the time, this was, like, pre-smartphones, I was going to Venice for a poker tournament and I was like, hey, I'm going to come back. Um, and then she was like, oh, I'm moving to the U.S. because she was going to teach at uh, in, in the U.S. And I was like, hey, like she was like, oh, you know, we could maybe help each other learn each other's language. Like yeah. I need to learn English and you want to learn Italian. And that's how we started talking. Well, reverse. But yeah, you wanted to learn Italian. You're right. Learn English. Yeah, but that's either fair. way, <laughs> that is um, <laughs> it's OK. And so you put a ring on it. <laughs> yeah. You put a ring on it. That's that was good. two years after we met. But did. Yeah, it took nice. a couple of years. It did. Did, she, yeah. did it take a while for her to like you? Um, no. Okay, good. She liked me right away. I knew you liked. You I liked, her, liked right her, her right away. I liked her right away. I knew. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. I, like I walked in, I was like, "Whoa, this woman is beautiful." Like, yeah. I just am very attracted to this. Yeah, person. yeah, good. Yeah, well, like her energy and uh, nice. all that stuff. Yeah. And you have a dual citizenship, U.S. and Italy. Yeah, I got that. Twenty twenty one. Um. Yeah, so I'm very excited about that through through marriage, of course. I was like actually looking to get it through ancestry because my parents or grandparents come from Italy, but then we got married and it was like, okay, well, we're gonna get it through this way instead. But uh, right, yeah, that's awesome too. We spend quite a few, quite a bit of time there. We have a place there, so we're there a couple times a year for several months at a time. We're going back in the spring. Nice. And it says here you lived in six different countries. You've been to fifty. Yeah. You just have a passion for traveling. Yeah, I mean, poker, like, the cool thing that drew me to poker when I was 18, like, I saw poker on TV, and they were, like, playing in Aruba at the final table or going to all these cool stops around the world. And so, for me, I was like, well, if I could just break even playing poker, but I can live this poker lifestyle and, like, travel to all these cool places and play poker and have it pay for it all, that would be amazing. And so, when I dropped out of school at 18, I started traveling. I couldn't play in the U.S. because I was only 18, so I moved to Australia and then I went to Europe to travel with tour. I went to Asia. And so it's just like poker kind of took me to all these different places because I wanted to compete, you know, in the big games, the highest levels. And I couldn't do that in the U.S. So I would just constantly like go around the world looking for games. Um, you know, we moved to Macau to play in the high stakes games there. So it's just like there were so many opportunities to see the world. And poker kind of was the thing, the vehicle that brought me there. So, yeah, and I love get, traveling. I love seeing yeah. new cultures. And when we get to the poker section, I want to ask you about something that you mentioned there. We'll get well, I'll save it for then. So we don't cross over too much. Um what countries did you live in and why did you live in six different countries? Were you from a military family? <laughs> well, of the U.S. and Italy, of course. Those are two so right of the way. <laughs> I, I went to live in Australia. It was the first one. I was 18. I went there for a month. I went to Sydney for New Year's and then to Melbourne. And I went to play in the Aussie Millions. And I loved it so much that when the tournament was over, I was staying at the Crown Casino. And it you know, just got expensive staying there for a long period of time. And I was like, you know what? I need to find an apartment here. And that was like my first time kind of away from home. I was 18. Um, and I was like trying to figure out how to like navigate. And so I was like, okay, let me find an apartment in this cool area. And I just loved it so much. I wanted to stay there. It was summer there. It was incredible. Mm. I could play poker online. I could play live. So that was one of the countries. Um, Macau, of course, I went there for high stakes poker. I spent four years there living there on and off. Um, France, we really loved, you know, we were right by Italy and we went to go live in the South of France. We got an apartment there multiple times over the course of several years. Um, and London for poker. I was there in London quite a bit for, for poker. There was always a tournament there and cash games and it was just cool. Yeah. So I just found like novelty in it that I can like experience a new culture and still like work, you know, that's cool. Felt like and, cheating. And I'm going to get to your poker stuff, but one question before I do, you know, when you're 18 and you're starting to grind poker, but you're living on your own, do you come from money? Um, like were I, you so supported because knowing I, at 18, it's hard to support yourself. As I mean, a I grew up player. in Orange County. So like, you know, I had a good upbringing, but like in terms of, you know, my poker playing, like that was always supported through me. Like I actually, I was always kind of like 
hustling and entrepreneurial, I guess. Like I started a flyer delivery company when I was in, like I was like 15 or something. I was like called Doormat Delivery and I would like pass out flyers. And I quickly learned that like I can double or triple my income by having multiple people that I would pass out flyers yeah. for. And so I was making 30, 40 cents a house, was making you know quite a bit of money. And I saved that money that I used to then fund my poker playing when I was 16. And when I dropped out of school when I was 18, um, I had saved up like 30, 40,000, you know, I was playing okay. online and I was playing in live games and I saved up quite a bit of money. And I remember my dad was like, you know, um, you know, I support you. I love you. Like this is what you want to do. It's your life. But like, you know, we spent like I was at SMU at the time, I had a partial scholarship, but I didn't have a full scholarship. SMU is a, you know, a nice university. He's like, look, I paid for half of this. Like I want my share of money back. And I, wow. I gave him $15,000 or I think it was 12 or $15,000. Wow. Um, to like refund that money that yeah. like he had invested in me because I dropped out. It wasn't like I finished and then I played yeah. poker. So he would, you know, and it was a fair thing for him to say. It was, it was the right thing. Like I respect th that. I gave him the money back, but I was always supporting myself through poker. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it says here you, other forms of revenue, you invest in crypto, real estate, and venture capital stuff. Would you tell me a little bit about each? Sure. So crypto I found in 2017, I guess it was early or late, depending on when you guys found crypto. Yeah. Um, so that kind of hit me right away. I realized like, I don't know, like it just clicked for me. I realized this is going to, I believe this is going to change the world. It's going to be like a huge thing that's never been seen before. And so that was like really captivating. And it, I just like followed my emotion. Like I felt like um, this is something like poker where like I found it and it just clicked and it was very exciting and it's hard to feel really excited about something when you have poker in your life because poker's like it moves so fast and like the business world and other things yeah. move so slow so crypto is really intuitive to me and that sort of stuck and i've been investing in that space for for a number of years real estate my parents are both in real estate so um i grew up understanding real estate and appreciating yeah. real estate for the cash flow it's also such a nice balance to everything else in my life that's much more high risk, asymmetric, volatile, right? right. Crypto, poker, venture right. capital. Um, so my, um, my dad is in the mobile home park space. He's been in uh, commercial for 35, 40 years, moved to mobile home park seven years ago. And so, um, we invest in deals in that space and most recently Northwest Arkansas and South Missouri put out some content about this and I helped, you know, raise money and syndicate the deals. Uh, so that's really exciting. We're looking for more spaces in that, uh, more, uh, parks in that space. And those have great cash flow, great depreciation, um, kind of like undiscovered nature well, of real estate. It's crazy they mentioned that because uh, that's like a, it's like billboards, but different. Meaning that a lot of people don't know how lucrative billboards are. They're you, unsexy. If you can, so if people you can develop them, right? They're not like the luxury Airbnbs yeah. that are like, oh, I have a vacation home that doubles yeah. as an Airbnb. It's boring. It's unsexy. But like, if you look at the depreciation is amazing. Uh, the cash flow is amazing because the people that um, own the mo mobiles, they own their own home. They're, the turnover is like once every eight years, whereas commercial, it's like once every 18 months. So like people aren't moving. They have pride of ownership. They take care of all the maintenance. So that's lower cost for us. Like there's all these sorts of benefits to it. Uh, I put an article about it if you guys are interested. Um, but yeah, that and then the VC space was obviously like just yeah very exciting like poker. You know, it kind of yeah. has that high risk, high reward. It's kind of like I look at VC like tournaments. So it's like small part of the portfolio just for these asymmetric high risk things where most yeah. go to zero, but if one of them hundred X's or thousand X's, um, that, that pays for the whole yeah. thing. Right. Yeah. And I'm very familiar with the mobile home space. I actually am in a couple partnerships, uh, in some big parks Yeah, and, uh, one in Oxnard, California and okay. one in Vegas. Yeah. And so, uh, I receive a lot of passive income and like you said, there's a lot of depreciation. So there's a lot of phantom income and, uh, there's a lot of depreciation. So at the end of the year, the partners in there receive a lot of, uh, uh, I, cause we've owned them for, for so long now there's some big distributions. Uh, it's, it's very lucrative. So, yeah, yeah, it is definitely. And I mean, there's, it's something like that hits differently. Like, I don't know, psychologically, at least for me, like getting a check or a ACH or deposit and you see this thing and you're like, Oh, what is that money? And it's like, Oh, it's money from an investment I made that I do nothing for. At, and I it just, just comes in every month. Like it hits different with everything else in my life that isn't like that. And it's just, it's a beautiful I just thing. Did a, I just did a piece. Um, I did a couple of times I talked about it. I, I call it NV rants and I did a piece on uh, money intelligence and another one, I did three of them. But anyways, I talk how I, how I got into my real estate investing and what I specialized in was mailbox money, passive income. Mm. And so you're speaking my language and, um, 
I say in the video, there's some almost like what you said. I said it's so powerful to have checks show up on a passive income like where where active income is when I owned like a computer company and we had to buy the computers, build them, sell them, collect the money, keep doing and repeating the same thing actively. But if you invest in real estate uh, and it's a passive income where once you invest in it, it keeps coming, you can get sick, you cannot work, you could go on vacation. It's just mailbox money. It's very powerful. So yeah. uh, that's, that's it what hits I built. differently too, psychologically. Like for me, it's like, yeah. it's almost like cheating. You're like, oh, I'm getting this dividend. That's I built my whole real estate career yeah. on passive income cash flow. Yeah, it's, that's the thing is the cash flow and real estate really does, does yeah. do that. Cool. That's very cool. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm on board. There. Of course, there's appreciation too. like the this, you know, the city that um, our, our, our previous park was in uh, in Arkansas is the fastest growing city in the state. It grew at 380 percent last yeah. year. So like the you know, it's exploding because like, you know, with remote work, people are moving to different places. It's kind of like this hidden area, you know, and you're kind of looking people are looking for the next Austin. You know, you already missed Austin. You miss Boulder. You miss Bend. You know, where are these next places that people right. are going to move? And so it's kind of like that's kind of the poker player in me. It's like opportunistic. It's like being ahead of the curve of like, what are people going to do before they do it? Like, and that was, you know, me going to Macau. It was like, okay, this is the next opportunity. I want to be here before everyone else or online poker in 2005. I want to be there before everyone else. And so I look at real estate in that way too. It's like, where are people going to be moving and where's the property going to appreciate? So then you have that with the cash flow. It's, well, we it's, have a lot in common because it's sexy. in 2008, nine, when the mark, when the real estate market crashed, when everyone was speculating and buying too much real estate with, with, you know, stupid naughty loans and yeah. we were buying um that's what we did and me and my and a partner we went into the first the first area we went into was las vegas because the prices have had inflated so much single family homes 300 350 I was buying them at auction for 50, 60,000 yeah. at the very bottom. Insane. And then that dried up. And the next one was speaking of going into the next market was Orlando, Florida. Oh my and gosh. And we went right into Orlando, Florida yeah, you and nailed we it. recreated the same thing, the same system and just cleaned up both. Yeah. It's like be like, you know, Buffett. I mean, sometimes wisdom is, is simple to understand, but hard to follow. It's like be greedy when people are fearful and fearful when people are greedy. Right? That's, That's what I also say in my video. Buy, Warren fear, Buffett's sell, quote. Greed. Warren yeah, Buffett. exactly. Like, so it's like yeah. everyone else is panicked and you're sitting there at the auction yeah. just printing. When right? everyone thinks the real estate market is the worst it's ever and stay away from it. That's when you buy. Exactly. And when everyone's going towards it, that's when you sell. It's crazy. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. yeah we not, have a lot of, in common. not a lot of people know that. Yeah. Uh, you write a newsletter, uh, about what? Well, I have two. Um, one's poker. It's called Crush Mondays. It goes out every Monday. It's at ConsciousPoker.com. It's free. Um, you Say know, it slower so people can maybe go subscribe. Fair enough. Thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, it's called Crush Mondays. It's at ConsciousPoker.com. C-O-N-S-C-I-O-U-S. Poker.com. And it goes out every Monday. It comes with poker tips, hand reviews from clients that I coach and work with or within our community where I break down interesting hands. Uh, new content that comes out on the Conscious Poker YouTube. That's every week. We have shorts or tweets of the week or Instagram posts. Yeah. And then just poker tips. Like we have, you yeah. know, talk about variants and stuff like that. So that's one of them. I've been doing that for many years. Remind and... me to talk about variants with you when we get to poker. I want to know what you think of it. Yeah, sure. Because I was just experiencing it recently. I've ran a lot of Sims on this too, so I'm happy to yeah, talk about it. Yeah, let's talk about that at some point, okay? And I don't have that in my notes, but I want to talk okay, about Okay, I'll it. write that down. And then All the right. second one is, uh, um, it's at... It's a investing and wellness newsletter. It's at alectorelli.substack.com. And I write about wealth and wellness. It's called Wealthier, W-H-E-A-L-T-H-I-R, because wealth and wellness are two things that I'm super interested in. And so it, it was originally about crypto. I started it like two years ago when crypto was moving fast. And I was trying to explain crypto simply for people to understand. So I wrote a big series on Bitcoin called The Future of Money. And there's like 10 installments about how money is changing and how it's changed throughout history and, and why I think Bitcoin's the future reserve currency of the world. Um, and so that's that's a, the most popular piece. But then there's just new updates on, I talk about mobile home parks, talk about venture capital. Um, talk you guys about might want to go subscribe. Yeah. Seriously, that's yeah, it's interesting it's, stuff. Yeah, like I, it's all free. Like I it just, it's a passion project, kind of like this is for you. It's like, just like, I feel like it's kind of a calling for me to help you other enjoy people it. on their journey. I love it. Like yeah. I was writing a piece this morning um, about trading, about investing, about my mindset and approach. And like a lot of the pair, there's so many parallels between poker and decision-making and investing, right? Like in poker, you know, you go to where the opportunity is. And like we talked about that, buy when people are selling, you know, like it's the same thing in investing too. So I noticed there's all these parallels. So I use a lot of poker analogies. Uh, people might find that interesting. Yeah, I think they would find it interesting. And, and it's something, you know, I enjoy doing this interviewing and doing that. I love this podcast, but when I do talk, 
and I go on and put out the NV rants about success, mindset, uh, wealth tips and stuff. And that's where my real passion is because that's what helped me get to where I'm at. So you have a YouTube channel on finance. Yeah. Is that right? Do I have so that right? So the newsletter um, goes out and then a lot of times I'll take the concept of the newsletter and turn it into a video. The YouTube channel is called Cryptorelli because like crypto and Torelli. Yeah, I get it. Um, yeah, so I made that channel. It's mostly, again, mostly about crypto, but there's some finance stuff too. Nice. And you're, you speak and you give lessons, but like, and you just mentioned this earlier, I caught it from your poker perspective and you apply it to life, business and investing. Yeah. That's kind of the concept, how you, how you say they're paralleled. Right. And like, the thing you mentioned, like, you know, your purpose, like I play poker and, you know, investing those, you know, you kind of do these things to make money. But like, you know, the thing that I'm really called by is like, I want to help people make better decisions. And poker is a great framework mm -hmm. for how to think through decision making, because, you know, poker and life are both games of incomplete information where there's predominantly skill that dictates your reality, but there's still an element of luck. You know, there's an element of luck in life. There's an element of luck in poker. And so it's like, you have to navigate this unknown framework and then like poker really teaches you to do that because there's probability, there's expectation, there's uh, variance, there's, you know, capital management or risk management in life. And so, you know, most of life is just being able to, to make great decisions, um, not emotionally, but intuitively or logically, right? Using your, your better frameworks for thinking through things and avoid emotional decisions, avoid ego, avoid tilt. That happens in life as well as poker. And so you really have to, you know, poker teaches you, I think, at a high level to like master your process, master yourself, master your own emotions, master your, you know, overcome ego and stuff like that. And yeah. So and in my book that I wrote seven figure decisions, I talk about one chapter is about decisions. <laughs> it's so awesome. funny. Yeah. And it's in, and, and I say in there, you know, not making any decisions is a decision. The first thing to do is you have to be able to make one. Cause there's a lot of people out there that research a lot of things they plan to do it, they plan to do it, they plan to do it, and then it passes them by. And I've often even said, you know, sometimes it's not a bad idea to just make a decision. Um, of course, there's a million things that go to that. And even if it's not the perfect decision, then you just make another decision to tweak it. I mean, because a lot of people just are always on the runway and they're never taken off, you know? Yeah, I think it's better to go the wrong way than go nowhere. Because at least if you're going the wrong way, eventually it's going to become obvious that you're going the wrong direction. Yeah. Like that's very clear to you if you, you know, have any sort of introspection or like self-awareness. So you're going to then say, okay, this is the wrong way. So then I need to turn a 180 and go around. Also, like you said, not making a decision is still a decision. So in investing, you know, not investing is still investing. You're investing in cash. And so because that currency can be printed and depreciated, you have this, you know, depreciating asset. So you're still investing. You're just choosing the US dollar as your main yeah, store of value. Yeah, you're with the fiat. Right. Uh, you're still investing in fiat, right? But there's yeah. alternatives. Of course, there's there's Bitcoin, but then there's also real estate, there's stocks. There's So it's like all of these complacency things are still a decision. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah no decision is a decision. Yep. Uh, okay. Gosh, I could, I'm not going to do that to the to the viewers. I know. We, we I have could, a separate podcast. I could literally <laughs> talk about that all day because I that I believe those principles, which there could tail off into a million different directions, are really the keys to success that people don't understand because most people, and again, respectfully, because of the way our society is built and framed, they are built and framed to stay within this box yeah. of, and, and there's nothing wrong with this. I've said this a million times. You go to school, you get a degree, you go and apply for a job, you get a job, you work the job, you get a retirement. You re hey, look, if you're doing that, God bless you. It, uh, there's, I, I'm not putting it down, but what, what most people don't understand is there's so many more opportunities outside of that box where you want to create real wealth. And it's just, it's just sick that so many people, because of the way society is designed, don't tap into that. And that's one of my passions too, is to talk about that. Yeah. And like, I mean, you know, poker, I have a business, I have a training site. Like, sure, I charge for poker if you want me to like give you my life experience in a day session. I'm, obviously, you know, it is what it is. But like my passion is, I think, hopefully, you know, more helpful to a wider range of people. And that that I always want to be free. Like I want to help share all the information I gather, synthesize that through videos and podcasts and shorts and, and articles and just, yeah, help people on their journey. It's like something we, we, we share that same passion. So yeah, it's really cool. Yeah. I didn't know a lot of that about you. That's really cool. Okay. So let's get onto the poker, your poker career. Let's cool. do it. You ready for that? Yeah, I'm ready. Poker is cool too. All right. So you started poker, you mentioned you were 18. So that's 2003. Yes. No, I started playing at 16. I was oh. in high school. I got invited to a friend's house and Poker just exploded on TV. Money Waker won the main event, and it was like the cool thing to do. 
And so I went to his house. I won $12. And I was like, wow, I was never, you know, I didn't make the basketball team. I quit football my freshman year. And I was like, I can be good at this game. And I can beat right. all these other people that are cooler than me and better than me at all these other sports. Yeah, right, right. It wasn't your lane. Those other I was things. in my lane. I was like, yeah. I got this. And obviously there's some bias towards winning your first time thinking you're better than you are. But right. So I started playing at 16, 2003. I went pro at 18, 2005. It's crazy. It's been so long, 18 years. It's nuts, right? That's half of my my life. I'm 35, so it's more than half of my life been yeah. a pro poker player. Yeah, it's crazy. Well, not a lot of people. No bullshit. Not a lot of people can say that. It's not easy to make a living in poker. Yeah, it's a very hard way to make an easy living, yeah. and it's one of those things that not it's a hard way to make an easy living. It's <laughs> it's it's almost sometimes easy to make a living for a short period of time. It's hard to make a living for a long period of time because there is variance, and so there's a self selection of like the people that run well in the beginning make a living for a year, and then variance hits, or they make make one mistake, they mismanage, and then the longevity thing is hard too in poker. I feel like. Yeah, that, yeah, I get it. Believe me, I get it. Yeah. Um. Okay. And it says here that uh, you, uh, you made over in your career a million dollars on online uh, cash earnings. Yeah, I played a lot of online starting out. So, um, I started playing in high school, and 2007 when I moved to Australia, I got up early one day because the time change is like crazy to play online tournaments. I won the biggest tournament online at the time. It was the F tops on full tilt and it was a quarter million in a day. And so for me, that was like life changing. And that kind of put me on the map in poker because I got some like, you know, media attention, whatever, made a final table of a tournament in Aruba before that too. So that kind of like, you know, propelled my career in terms of like in the public eye. But then in that year, 2007, I was playing already 10, 20 on party poker, 25, 50, which was the biggest game on the site. And then, so I started playing bigger, like 25, 50 consistently. And then I moved up quickly to, you know, I was playing a lot of heads up. I played the biggest games on online, which was 200, 400, no limit. And I was like, I think the sixth or seventh biggest winner in the world that year. I made a million dollars that year in 2007. Wow. So that was, uh, you know, completely life changing. That was 19 at the time living in Australia. And so maybe that's why I liked Australia so much too. I was like, yeah, living on, on this high at a young age. That's really um, cool. Yeah, so I played a lot of online poker in the early days, but I was always opportunistic. Obviously, like I knew online was not going to last in the sense that it wasn't going to be this gold mine that it was. And so I was always like looking for the next, you know, I heard a great quote at a marketing conference one time, like you either have to be the first or you have to be the best. It's so much easier to be the first than the best. But if you're the first, it's easier to be the best because you become the best by being the first. And then it's easier to stay on top once you're on top. So that's kind of been like the process I've used through my career. It's like, okay, I want to be ahead of the, of the curve but I want to stay ahead of the curve. And so it's like, you have to be the best, but you also, you know, be the first. So I've kind of moved around towards, you know, online and then Vegas and then Macau and, you know, different opportunities. Yeah, like that's no, that's sure. the poker hustle, you know? It's the poker hustle for sure. And it's like, you know, uh, I always tell people because I've been in business 30 years and I've had so many different businesses that I've opened and shut that nothing lasts, usually nothing lasts forever. Not every niche lasts forever. And, you know, it's like if you were the inventor of the actual fax machine, you, and you were the first, you probably made a lot of money, right? Because they were just, everyone had one. But at some point, nobody has one, right? So right. you have to evolve. You have to change. You have to go a different direction and find a different lane. And uh, that's what you're talking about. Yeah, and that's why, like, you know, I was mentioning before, like, the longevity thing in poker. It's hard to find people that are in poker for a very long time because their exploit, whatever that is, right? They're ahead of the curve or they found this one game online, these heads up, sit and goes, or whatever it is, right? Whatever niche they've found to exploit to make money dries up because markets are efficient. And so eventually if there's a lot of opportunity and a lot of money to be made and it's easy to make that money and the barrier to entry is low, there's going to be enough people that are hungry enough to chase that opportunity until that that reaches equilibrium and it yeah. becomes very hard. And so yeah. you have to always iterate and get better, but you also have to find new opportunities. And that's, well, you know, it's, it's hard funny. in business, but it's, it's hard in poker too. Yeah. It's funny too, because like, I know this and, and what you said here, you know, I <clears throat> always played poker over the years as a total wreck business owner, I, I had nothing about poker in this last year. I, I, I don't, I don't really know. Cause I just think I don't, what really constitutes a pro, but I play for a living and I run a poker show. So yeah. I, don't, I don't no, know. You got a lot better. I don't know. Like, I don't know if I am, but my point, Oh yeah. And I, you but, got good at poker. Yeah. I mean, but you but got, my, you know, my point very is, solid is my poker. first year as playing poker only, between on stream and off stream, probably three quarters of a million dollars is what I made. Right? Yeah. It's incredible. But here's the thing. The first two months of this year, I'm getting my balls kicked in mm. with a with a uh, you know a, a major downswing. So what you're saying is true. The only thing is, is I'm smart enough to know 
that there has to be adjustments made. I have to recognize it. I have to manage my bankroll. I'm taking some time off. I'm rethinking some things. And so what you're saying is actually true. And I could see is if you're someone who is, you know, me, I, I'm, I'm lucky enough to already have money. So, but if I really was grinding that bankroll up to what I did, and then I just went on this big variance downhill slalom, like it could put you, it could put you out, just like you're saying. So the longevity, anyone in poker that has played poker for whether it's 18 years or how many years, and they are making that kind of money, it's very rare because poker, like you said, is a very hard way, hard way to make easy money. Yeah, and I always tell clients I work with too, like it's always, it's cool to play poker to be able to play it's not that cool to have to play and that's just like the truth like if you yeah. have to play poker to like pay rent and yeah. you're like what i call there's a there's a level where like you're where i call above the bullshit right where like the money you're playing with doesn't affect the material uh aspect of your daily life with yeah. like your rent your food your expenses whatever yeah. if you're above that level poker's great yeah because it's like the losses don't sting as much and like you're not translating your daily results into oh but i can't do this in the real world because i lost at poker like if you're in that space where you're translating that and you have you have to grind through that sometimes you, you everyone starts at that space unless you come yeah you saw you you come sidestep into poker from money through you, through you make money through something else and that's the sweet spot to be in but if you're coming up through poker it's very hard to get through that level and that's that's the challenging part where most people don't yeah don't get it's through. a very small group yeah and it's it's tough because like you know losing really affects you when it comes out of the bills well, and the that's rent. that's what I mean. And, and then, and then it's the harder pressure. to play well and the harder pressure. Play, yeah. Yeah. You start playing scared, you play worried, you know, so it's, I, I don't, or you can't take a month off, right? Like, correct. Which is what, and there's a difference between being good at playing poker and being a good poker player. And like things you're talking about are being a good poker player. It's like, you know, you're smart enough to know that you need time off. You're smart enough to know you like, this is a downswing. How do I, how do I react? How do I come back? And those things, you know, come with maturity and wisdom too. And sometimes people end up losing, learning the hard way that, you have to learn those lessons and I learned yeah. the hard way, you know. I learned a lot of those lessons in business, so I have a lot of wisdom coming right. from variance in business. And you came to poker at a mature age. Like I yeah. I matured through poker. So yeah. it's like I learned all these lessons by losing a lot of money. That's the way that I learned. That was the pain that Freud says you run, you know, right. towards pleasure and run from pain. It's so why I lost a million dollars after I made a million dollars because I had a lot of ego and I didn't manage myself and my emotions and my bankroll correctly. So I was twenty, I lost a million dollars playing poker. I, I have a video about it on my YouTube, wrote an article about it. Um, and so, you know, I learned like these things and I'm like, oh, well, this is, you know, how to, well, for all you up and comers, this is good information for you because <laughs> sometimes you got to learn this yourself without hearing it. So take heed if you're listening. Um, you won two back to back WPT events at the Bellagio. You're the only one to ever do that. I think is still right? to this day at the time, definitely. I haven't like updated the, you know, if anyone's ever done it, I'm, I'm guessing not. Cause it's kind of, you know, one of those things where you need you know, a random event to happen. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I was at the WPT uh, Festa Lago at Bellagio in October. And um, I played, you know, there's like a series of events there and uh, I won two of them back to back days. It was actually kind of crazy because um, Jonathan Little got second both days. So Isn't we we played heads up both days. Wow. And I won. And obviously there's some, you know, there's some, there's some luck there too in the sense that like, you know, we both made it to the final two both days, right? Of course. There's just some serendipity. But yeah, that was crazy. We were on, you know, at the time, I think the cover of Poker Pro Magazine for this, stuff like that, when, you know, there's all these poker publications and stuff. So they, they did a piece on it because it was just so like mathematically like crazy, right? Yeah, you two both back to back. Right, and then like now we both are like still in poker, right? Yeah. Which is kind of rare too. This was like in 2009. I had just finished a triathlon. So 2009, I think. And, you know, we're both still in poker, you know, more than a decade later, we both have training sites. Like, it's just like kind of this yeah. crazy story. You know, I've watched some of his videos. He's done a couple on me and other people. And uh, he's, he sounds very knowledgeable. But one thing I like about him is he's very fair. Yeah. Seems very fair to me. Like when I listen to what he, when he does his pieces, he doesn't ever tear anyone down to make content. He's just, he makes good content. Yeah. If, if you're objective and kind, that's, that goes a long way. Yeah. yeah. And you started coaching in 2013. What made you do that? Well, I think... It's like one of those things where I really, you know, I built, you know, now I have a, a brand. I built, a, like, I like sharing things. I like connecting with people. Like, poker is a very solitary game, largely, right? Like, you're always on your own. You're making all your decisions on your own. It's like, you, know, you have to build a sports circle and whatever. And so this was a way that I can, like, plug into my audience and connect with people and, like, help share what I learned to help others on their journey. And that was, like, seemed like an obvious way to do that. You, you enjoy know? it. 
I really like it. Yeah. yeah. I still coach this day and now it's, it, it's, it's different. I'm in a different place and I work with different clients, but like I get to meet really cool people. Yeah. They're, they're very doing, you know, they're very successful at business or what they do and they're, you know, run a company or whatever. And it's super interesting because they're, you know, in their lane doing something at a very high level. And these people are super competitive, right? Like they're used to performing at a very high level. They're used to winning. And, or maybe a lot of times I work with people that were competitive athletes in college and now maybe they're seniors, they just retired, or maybe they're, yeah. you know, in their forties and they can't be a competitive athlete anymore, but they still want to feel that level of competition. So they turn to poker and like, so they're really driven by all these other deeper things. And it's really cool to work with people like that because, yeah. you know, it's really meaningful for them to achieve something in poker. And you then do- some people want the business side and they want to make money. You just but- decide, you just described me. I used yeah. to love sports. I was into sports. I'm 56. Poker is my competition, right. you know, and I love it. That's part of what I love about poker is yeah. the competition. And it's I, really cool to help, like, see someone that texts me, like, a you know, story client won a tournament last week or someone texts me, like, hey, I won a 40K yeah. upswing. And it's yeah. like the, the light bulb goes on. And they and then they – a lot of people are get bored with poker because they stop learning and it just gets frustrating and sort of monotonous. But then when they see a deeper level to it, they reinvigorate that excitement for the game that they felt when they first started playing. And so, like, that sort of – yeah, is exciting and that feedback yeah. that comes towards yeah, me as the to, coach. You get to enjoy the fruits of your life. right. Is like it's awesome. Yeah, you know, it's really it's really been rewarding. Um, it's 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 led me to some amazing people too that I've become cool. friends with, which is nice. really cool. All right, guys, I want to take a minute. We got a new sponsor here on the show. It's Only Poker. It's a new poker app. It's an all-in-one poker app community. It will give you stats, tell you where the games are, allow you to go in and uh, post games at any location in the world. Uh, It allows you to build circles, which means you can build communities and have chat uh, circles for certain groups. You could be part of numerous groups. Uh, It has everything. It has poker gossip, poker news. Go and sign up Only Poker. Struggling to find an all-in-one platform for the latest poker news and thrilling poker stories? Only Poker has got you covered. The platform is packed with exciting poker news, discussions, and games that you won't be able to resist. Share your thoughts with friends on the hottest poker topics in our circle. Discover the best poker games anytime, anywhere, and secure your seat at the table. Find all your poker needs in one place. Download only poker and join the best poker community today. Yeah. And uh, so you have a YouTube poker channel 10 years uh, by now, You right? Is when you started it, it says? Yeah. Crazy, huh? And you started uh, the hand of the day. I started that in Macau or actually maybe in Monaco or Macau. Well, 10 years is when you got married. So it might have been right when you got married. Yeah. And, you know, Ambra, like, I think, you know, it was a joint thing and she was filming me like, you know, the beginning and like helping in the just, hands of the day, right. Just that. like marketing production, like just helping me with everything. She's been right by my side the whole time. And so your, your channel has to the date about 15 million views. You got up almost 70,000 subs Yep, and you've have over 500 videos there. Yeah. It's been, you what's know, your channel called conscious poker. Oh, it's the conscious poker. Yeah. Like got at it. the beginning it was like Alex Rally, but when I started conscious poker, <laughs> I just changed the name to kind of fit the brand. Um, but so I started the channel way before conscious poker, like maybe oh, four see. years yeah. before I opened a training site and I didn't start it to like, I didn't start it with any like business plan. I mean, it took four years before I built a training site. So it wasn't, I didn't have like some long tail, like I'm going to monetize or whatever. It was just like, Hey, I have a, this like kind of crazy, cool poker life. Uh, I'm in Macau, I'm traveling the world. I play all these cool, crazy hands and have all these stories. I just felt compelled to like, want to share that with other people. And then hopefully like you know, connect with others and help them on their journey. So I just started talking about hands that I played that were interesting. And I made this format called the hand of the day Mm. and that kind of stuck. People were like, Oh, tell me more. And then, so the coaching sort of came organically through people like reaching out to me, like, Hey, do you offer coaching? Or, you know, the first book I wrote, people were like, Hey, do you have a book? Uh, And so like, I started to kind of listen to the audience and create the things that they told me they wanted as a service or a product. And so conscious poker was kind of like, you know, had a long time coming and born out of all this you know, sort of built up demand from yeah. building an audience over time. And you, uh, then you took their, their input and wrote the book, the poker coach. Yeah. So someone reached out to me about writing a poker book. Um, and I actually didn't come up with the name. I mean, I'm, I'm flattered by the name and it's, it's it sounds a little self aggrandizing. So I didn't come up with this name, but they, you know, the publishing company has all the rights of like kind of how it works. They're like, this is how we market it. This is the cover. These are the graphics. And I was kind of like, Hey, can I do this with my graphic designer? And they're like, no, 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 that's not how it works. Um, so they came up with this, this, you know, this book and this name and this thing. And, but they gave me freedom to like outline it and, and write it how I want. And so, yeah, I, I wrote something that I thought would be 
really good for people that were wanting to learn poker that were coming from um not necessarily coming from business world but just like not coming from a poker background so right. it's not like a very i mean it gets into some of the Successful principles Successful business rex right and it gets into some of the principles that are a little bit deeper like hand reading and i talk about my hand range funnel and like pot odds and, and ranges and stuff like that so it gets into some of the more the deeper concepts but it, it's coming from a perspective of like here's how to treat poker like a business here's how to think about the mindset the bankroll management and like how much you should be risking here's some of the variants involved and then here's like how to build the strategy like layer it from the ground up and so it's meant to be like a linear walkthrough book of of how to help people where would so, one find that book the pokercoach.com i bought that domain after right they told me the title um so the pokercoach.com you'll see reviews all the books we have 100 plus reviews most five star really proud of that yeah. um so yeah, thepokercoach.com or just look on Amazon for the poker coach. Or... You think maybe I could score a copy of that? Totally. All right, I'll give you one of mine. Yeah, My, let's mine's do not it. very good, but I dine to read yours. Let's swap signed copies. All right, you got it. Yeah, deal. Um, I give away a copy of the poker coach almost every week when I play on the Hustler, oh, um, and nice. so either that or like a piece of merchandise. And I always do this fun thing where like you have to guess my result, and the closest person to guess my result on Twitter or Instagram gets a free copy of the book, a wow. signed copy. I mail it to them. Or like a piece of merchandise or maybe a membership at Conscious Poker. Who's the jerk that got a copy when you lost the most? Oh, yeah. So some people guess like this one guy, like <laughs> I lost 47,000 one week, I, I know, 155 and lost 47. But like the guy that guessed is like minus 49,000. I'm like, fuck, this guy was exactly yeah. right. Like, yeah, yeah. I sent him a signed copy. Here yeah, you go. There buddy. it like, is. Yeah. yeah. Well done. Nice. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> yeah. Right. If you don't guess negative, I mean, you're going to be wrong. <laughs> right. 40% yeah, of the time. Poker, yeah. Right. It's poker. Yeah, it is. I mean, so. Yeah. 60% of the Especially time. Especially when they see everyone else guessing positive. Right, if they if they're like two hours late to the tweet and they see like nine people guess positive, yeah, yeah. people, you know, people in some people in poker, poker players, and of course, <clears throat> you know, people just starting and even a lot of people have been around it, don't realize that what you said is exact stat that I that I have in my head and that I know is that if you're a really good poker player, you're probably only going to win about sixty percent of yeah. the time. You're gonna have to, you know. Yeah. Ish, right? Yeah. <clears throat> depends yeah. on how long you play. Depends how long on how soft you play. the game. I mean, right. There's a lot of variables. Yes, of course. It could be up to 70, but it's never, it's not 90%. Like that's impossible. Right. It's not even 80. It's no. maybe 70 it's at the like high It's not like the end. fastest runner is going to win nine out of 10 races right. or 10 out of this 10. This isn't chess. Like Magnus yeah. always wins. Like it's yeah. not like that. No. Yeah. 60% is, is very good. 70% is like. Insane. Yeah. Like world class, but also the variables have to be in your favor. You have to be playing longer sessions, super soft, like, you know, games course, where your edge is a lot bigger so yeah. yeah yeah okay so in your words from what you know from your experience from your research tell me about variance let me let me tell you more what i want to know yeah about variance why variance happens i know it's mathematics how you're supposed to handle variance basically that like if somebody is going through variance and you were to talk to them what would you say Okay, I know so, that's broad, but yeah, that's broad. And then there's like a there's a psychological component, and then there's like a math component. So both, yeah, the both, right? So the first thing is, um, and so we have a we have a program called Alex Academy, which is a poker business course, and it's meant to help people turn poker into a business. So the whole first part of the the course is like building the business. So it's it's what you do before you even play poker at the table. Like no strategy is involved in the first part, and it's all about building a business. And so the first whole part of the course is bankroll management, and with that comes understanding the variance involved. Because if you don't understand the, the variance, you can't properly plan a bankroll that's adequate to withstand the swings you're going to experience. Now, the swings you're going to experience are based on how soft the games are and how good you are relative to the other players, right? Your win rate in poker is the difference in skill between you and your opponents minus the rake. So if you have a very, very big edge and you're playing many, many hours in a given month, you might not need as big of a bankroll or as many buy-ins because you're not going to go on a, a very long downswing and your edge is bigger. So you're not going to, you're not going to have as many uh, buy-ins that you're going to be losing. You don't need as many buy-ins uh, to withstand that variance. And so th there's like a sort of a formula here. So there's different variables that you enter into, into a, a calculator, let's say, and it spits out a solution. So I walk people through how to use that. There's a calculator later available at Prime Dope. But we have content about this on Conscious Poker on the YouTube. I walk people through how to use it. It's obviously more in-depth in our course, but it's also free at Conscious Poker on the YouTube. So it's it's. I would say like that's really important to do as an exercise because until you know the variance, you don't know how to play in the bankroll. And then also mentally, there's the mental component too, right? 
if you know that you're going to experience something, it's a lot easier to handle that experience, right? right. The analogy I always use with clients is like, look, if if I tell, let's say I'm your trainer, right? And we're, I'm a personal trainer and I'm your trainer. I say, hey, you're going to have to run a mile. And, you know, I tell you this the day before, tomorrow you're going to run a mile, be here at 8 a.m. And we're, you're going to run a mile around the track. It's, you're ready to do that activity. You get prepared and you're ready to run that mile, right? But if I told you at the end of that mile, now you have to run three more miles. You're like, fuck, I can't do that. I'm right. out. I'm right. done. I already, I'm done. I already committed to a mile. I didn't commit to four. But if I told you the day before you have to run four, you can still probably, you know, you can get through it. You can walk it. You're ready. So it's like that with poker and the variance too. Like if you know you're going to experience 20 buy-in downswing, and I'm not saying that's the number, but if it is, you know, you're going to experience 20, you don't, and you have a 20 K bankroll, you know, you can only play five, 10 and buy in one K or two, five and buy in deep. And you're ready for that experience. And when you lose 10, you're not necessarily going to play as bad because you, you've, you've compartmentalized that and you built that into your yeah. framework for decision making. Yeah. So that's super important. And um, poker is a game where I don't want to say it doesn't matter how well you play when you win, but most people play pretty good when they win. Like yeah, you, you're in the zone because you've got confidence and you're playing good and it's going well. It's going well. You're willing to make big folds. You're not getting it in. You're not spazzing out. You're willing to like avoid the spots and just not yeah. three bet with the seven five suit. Like you don't, you're just like, I don't care, you know? And so poker is really a game where your results are dictated by how well you play when you're losing relative to how well everyone else plays when they're losing. Cause everyone plays pretty damn well when they're winning. Certainly better players play better, but you get the idea. And so you have to build that into your framework of like how you're going to respond. And you have to be ready to respond when you're down 10 buy-ins and you still have to have the aggression to be able to three bet the hands. You know, you're supposed to three bet right. to double barrel when you're supposed to double barrel. Yeah. Because you sit there and you're like, I don't want to do that right now. Right. Or like, I'm just going to call here because I'm running bad, or I'm just going to call this spot because I never hit the turn, or I'm just, I'm not going to bluff here. Cause I don't want to incur the variance. And as soon as you do that, you're fucked. Like it's over. You've lost. You <laughs> it's get, over. You've given up all your edge, <laughs> especially in like the games we play. They're higher stakes. They're more competitive. Yeah. If you're not willing to pull the trigger, you're just, you're just drawing dead. Yeah. And so, you know, Building that into your mental framework is like super important. And I like, you know, at this point in my poker career, I do work on the strategy, but I would say like half of the time I'm working on the game, I'm working on myself. You know, I'm working on mastering myself and like, how do I play at my capacity? How do you work on that? The psychological part of poker, the <sighs> emotional part of poker. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, a lot of ways. I mean, I've worked with, you know, ment mental coaches in the past, um, done like, you know, mental training and hypnosis. Like I've done a lot of things like that. Um, and now that's some of what I teach to, to clients and stuff like that too. But, um, you know, like just doing mental, like framework visualization, like how I want to play and like how I want to feel when I'm at the table and like instilling in myself that I'm fearless and confident and that I I'm able to execute on the plays in the big spots because look like in our games too, you know, we have the world watching, we have all the armchair quarterbacks, everyone's critiquing every play we make. Um, and we're also playing for a lot of money. It's under pressure. I think playing on TV or whatever you want to call it, uh, even if the money is smaller, it's harder to play on TV than it is to play oh, yeah. games that are bigger, that are not televised. I've for had experience sure. in both. I've it's played... hard. It's hard playing when every eye is on you making a much a, harder assumption of what you should, shouldn't do. And, you know, and everyone has perfect information. So they all know the right decision. Oh, and yeah. you don't know the right decision. No, of course. Yeah. And so like a lot of what I do is focused on gearing up for these moments where it's like very hard to be at your best. And there's a, there's a difference between, you know, me at my A game and me at my B game or my C game. Uh, and so, yeah, like I do like, you know, fasting sometimes and like working out. And so like my workouts are more, um, they're as much mental as they are physical. And a lot of what I'm training myself to do is to perform at a very high level mentally under a lot of pressure. So like I'll run on the treadmill and this might sound crazy, but like, I'm trying to be the best poker player I can, you know, so I'm doing things that seem kind of extreme, but sure. that's kind of where I'm trying to compete at. And so I'll, I'll run on the treadmill, right? And let's say I'm doing sprints on the treadmill. I'll run at 10.0, which is like pretty fast. You know, you have to pretty exert a lot of effort. Uh, and I'll do that for like a minute or two minutes, right? So I'm, I'm pretty much at my physical capacity. But while I'm doing that, I'm trying to breathe through my nose and slow my heart rate down. And I'm also trying to visualize mistakes I make at the table. So I'm, I'm walking through an entire hand with like all, you know, poker happens slowly, right? So I'm visualizing mm -hmm. like my betting patterns, my emotions, and like how I'm acting and how I'm, I'm playing through hands. And I'm replaying hands that I made a mistake at the table and I'm replaying them correctly, you know, cause when you like visualize yourself doing something correctly, you like imprint in your mind, how you want to respond in a situation before you've been there. So let's say I get the lineup, you know, from Feldman, whatever, and I'll go to the gym the day before the session, I'll visualize like, okay, if this player's to my left, 
these are the spots I'm going to attack and this is how I'm going to play. And so I'm like getting in this like mental zone where like by the time I get to the table, I'm just like extremely focused. Is that why and I'll meditate twice a day? Is that why when I was to your left that when I would, when the board, when I would be the pre-flop raiser, the board would come and you wouldn't think it was in my range and I would make a C bet, you would always raise with nothing. Was that the card you had on me? No, it wasn't necessarily about you. It was... <laughs> That was more of a joke, <laughs> but that did you. happen a couple of times. That, but that was more. Well, one time that was I had more top of a joke against you. You did. You did. Was so, it I mean, tens? I'm, yeah. Yeah. I wasn't bluffing. I mean, no, I no, it was a joke. It was Fair a enough. joke. Um, do you? Speaking of like seeing and I didn't, you didn't say the word anchoring. Do you work NLP ever? Um, well, so like some of the things that I did in hypnosis were like you know you repeat you, you count your count yourself down to like get into like a yeah alpha state right and then you kind of like repeat affirmations, mantra, whatever you want to call sure, it. Like sure. people label, like they hear labels and they get, they, they're triggered or they feel something. So you repeat a statement to yourself about how you want to perform. Yeah. And so one of the things that I learned, uh, and this is something I, I work with clients too, is like your subconscious mind doesn't understand the negative form of something, right? So if we do an exercise and we could try this with, with the audience, like if I tell you to close your eyes and not think about a red umbrella, don't think about a red umbrella, don't think about a red umbrella, don't think about a red umbrella, whatever you visualize, don't think about a red umbrella. You can try and think about a green snake or a purple car or a blue goldfish, but like somewhere within your frame of visualization is a red umbrella, Yeah. right? And so what I told you not to, I told you not to think about this object, but it's still there. It's certainly more prevalent than let's say, you know, a, a green Gatorade. Right. Yeah, because right. I told you, I, I brought this into your, 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 your idea. And so a lot of people, what they do in poker is they tell themselves the thing that they don't want to experience or feel or do. They say, I don't want to play bad. I don't want to tilt. I don't want to lose focus. I don't want to make dumb decisions, you know, whatever. And so you really have to be careful about the programming you're choosing to put in your mind because your, your, your subconscious mind responds to the way that you, so what you would you, re it, what right? would you replace? I don't want to play bad. I don't want it. What would you replace that with? So my mm. mantra that I use is like, you know, I, something simple would be like, my goal is to play the next hand the best way possible. Right. So that's affirmative and it's stated in the positive of how you want to perform, be, right. think and feel. So saying, I don't want to make a mistake consciously to you is the same thing as saying, I want to play the next hand perfect. Not making mistake. You just have to reframe how you say it and not put it into a positive. Right. Not making a mistake and playing perfect are like two sides of the same coin. But your interpretation of those things on a functional level are profoundly different. Yeah, because you have fear of making a mistake. But right. when you frame it, I just want to play the best hand. There's no fear there because you're right. just telling yourself what you want to do and, and you're going to do. It's a command to yourself to perform at your capacity, right? So mm -hmm. these are all sorts of like things that I'm doing, whether it's through meditation I do twice a day or like at the gym, the visualization, like, I mean, yeah, it's all part of like how what I, what the hell did to... you say to yourself when you lost the 47 ball before? <laughs> <laughs> what was your, whatever you said, get rid of that. Quit poker. Get rid of that. No. So honestly, like my, uh, and that's something that, you know, is really, it's really challenging. Cause like my, you know, getting ready for a game to me is like a big sort of process. Right. So like my, approach to getting ready for poker is like, you know, a lot goes into it. And so it's extremely rewarding when I win 55 and I just feel like I played phenomenal, sure. but I get rewarded for playing phenomenal. And it's really frustrating when I still feel like I played pretty damn good, but I lost 47. I ran into aces three times that session. I just put out a video about it today, which by now will be in a couple weeks, but I, the video is called, I got destroyed on hustler. And I got destroyed. I ran into aces three times. Yeah. And so like, but other hands too. And maybe you make one mistake and it's session turning. Sure. And so like, it's very frustrating to give all of this effort and energy and attention of and course. dedication and then not be rewarded. Like that is very hard for people that don't play poker to understand. It doesn't happen in other f aspects of life. You know, like yeah. in chess, if you do everything that I'm talking about and you Why make do, better moves, you're yeah. going to win. Why do I picture you before a session sitting in the middle of a room with a poncho with <laughs> your hands up Indian style with like a bunch of incense smoke no, around you? No, 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 not at all. Okay, cool. Like I, I'm, I'm, people probably get the idea that I'm more like Zen and like yeah, yeah. all of this stuff that I am like, no, like sometimes it's just like on the treadmill. Right. Yeah. yeah. Like I'm more of an active person. I like to do things. It's hard for me to sit still. So like the idea of me like sitting in this perfect Zen state and meditating with all these incense is like, I don't even have time to light the incense. No, I like, I, you know, like I'm at the treadmill. It's more of a troll. Right. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, do you think that taking poker breaks are a good thing, a bad thing, plus or negative? How do you feel about that? That's great. Yeah. They're good. I think most people um, have a limit to how much poker they can play at their capacity and play well. 
And that's different for every person and it's different at different times of everyone's life. And when you're losing, that pie of how often poker can be in your life shrinks, right? Yeah. So being mindful and respective of the process is something that I had to learn, like I said, through, you know, ignorance. So you think it's healthy? Ignorance and arrogance. And it cost me a lot of money. Very healthy. And I think like, you know, I've always been like a part-time, full-time pro. Like when I was in Macau, I would play 80 hours a week, but then I'd go to Italy and not play for a little while because like you need that equilibrium. But it's very hard, I would say, for most people to play 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year for five years. Like that is not... Even of the professionals, oh, yeah. that is not. Well, I can tell you, I people are operating for one point a uh, year and eight months. Yeah, two to four times a week, every week. That's a lot. Okay, a lot. And and like I said, I was on a good trajectory, so it was a little easier. But right, then yeah. when I hit the down uh, trajectory, I and it's a big joke on the. We, I and I started it because I started going. I'm eight in a row, nine in a row, ten in a row, <laughs> and I don't know if it was like eleven in a row or twelve in a row. I forget what it was. Losing sessions. And, uh, you know, Man. my games play big too. So like it's, it's, you know, it adds up. It adds up. And, uh, I was there for, a few. you were there for a few of them. Yeah. You got to reap the rewards, but, and that punt to you with the ACE five of hearts oh, was yeah. just a pure punt. Yeah. Like and that I mean, was just a punt. I of woke frustration. up with it too. Yeah. You had it aces. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. And so, but anyways, regardless, that's the point is, is I, I broke the streak and won like 20 something thousand. And when I realized I needed the break was when I still didn't enjoy myself. Yeah. I won. I broke the, the, the downhill slalom and I was so miserable at the table. Right. Even after I won where I, I was driving home and I said to myself, you know what? That's it. I need a break, man. Like I was so thin skinned and cranky, even when I was winning that I thought, okay, I, I need to take a mental break. I need to get back to the basics, go work out, go do things. Right. And I'm only a couple of weeks into it. I feel amazing. Like it was hard for me at first because you get addicted to playing. Like when you're not go, like when you're going to play, it's exciting and you and, and it fills time and it's like you love because you love doing you love doing it. But what's nice about this is it's been a couple of weeks and 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 I realized if I never played poker again, I wouldn't. I'd be sad, but I'm okay. And so and I needed to know that like and and just taking the break and being home and like whatever. So I believe when I come back, I will be fresh. And I but the only thing I want win, lose or draw is I want to have fun. Yes. Right. And I wasn't having fun. And that's something I always tell clients to people are asking me like, hey, I need a break or people DM me all the time. Like, hey, I'm losing. I'm on a downswing. You know, should I take a break and how long? And I always tell people like what worked for me is not to put this arbitrary thing no time on. on like a week. It's being aware of your own emotions and how you feel and understanding that the time to come back is when you really feel like playing poker and it's yeah. the number one thing you want to do in your life. Yep. Until you feel that emotion towards poker where you're excited about it, it's not time. Yeah. And I noticed that like, you know, you, you kind of alluded to this too, like doing something else in your personal life that empowers you, whether it's working out or brings you confidence back that you feel at the table, like accomplish something, like you work on a project or you go back to your business or you build something, whatever that is, that kind of gets your momentum back. Cause in poker, you lose all that momentum. But when you build that back in your personal life through like, you know, routine, routine diet, nutrition, and, and business, whatever it is, you kind of feel like, all right, I, I got my shit back. And then you're ready to go tackle poker. Yeah. It's funny you say that because instinctually when people ask me, well, are you coming back next week? week after? I said, to be honest with you, I don't know. Yeah. It could be next week. That's the right It could answer. be two weeks. It could be a month. That's I don't answer. know. I'm going to know when I know. But like you said too, I've been, um, it's it's opened up more time in my my brain to where like I've been crushing business the last couple of weeks like where I'm now refocused on some of the things that I really needed to like go harder on because you know when you play two or three two or three times a week there's only so many hours in a day it's all consuming yeah it's very consuming especially so. if like you're at this point you know you're now you're starting to study you're like reviewing you know you're talking to talking with hands with friends like it's not like you know people see like, oh, you played five hours on the stream and no. three hours after, oh, it's only eight hours. It's like, it's everything that's before and after those eight hours, you know? And I if would, you're building content I would literally it too, study before I played and then I would go home after a session and I would redo the session with somebody. Yeah. So it's yeah. the whole day. Yeah, and then it's the, a little bit the day after because then your sleep schedule's interrupted and yeah. then you got to get back on track. It's like three yeah. days a week is a lot. It's a lot. At the high levels, you know, big games with the yeah. emotional it, volatility too to get back on track. It's hard to go from losing 100K business the next day where the pace of business is like, you know, a, a, a fraction of the pace of poker. Yeah. It's hard to go send those emails. It's yeah. pretty boring. It's boring. It's yeah. easy when you win. You don't, like I, I said, didn't want to do any win. of that when I was going through it. I just wanted to just sit there and like 
vegetate. Right. Yeah. So no, all true. Get shit. off your diet. It's hard when you get well, off. I'm your always diet. off my diet. Oh, but, shit. but you know what I mean. Yeah. But no, I've actually been doing a little better than that. I've been working out more. I feel really good. Yeah. yeah good for really you. Good. Yeah. yeah. It's a game changer. Yeah, I want my 175 ball back that I lost in those few weeks, but but I'll I'll survive. You'll get it back. Yeah. That's that's definitely within no striking distance. It's nothing burger. at this game. Yeah. It's nothing burger. So okay, Alec. Let's talk about the hand. The hand. Okay. Let's do it. <clears throat> Arms gonna, up. I'm going to preface something here first. I want to preface it. So here's the thing. Six years ago, yeah? Yeah. Six years ago when the controversy happened with the hand. Well, the thing is the hand happened a year before the controversy. So I'm trying to think if it was six or seven. But anyway, yeah, I get what you're saying. Oh, because it didn't air? No, it aired. It just, the controversy arose from what people in poker making videos about it. Oh, and so, okay. But why did it take a year? I don't know. That's a okay, good question. That I didn't know. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. I'll tell you what I'm going to do before we get into the hand. I'm going to go ahead and show the raw uncut video that maybe you haven't seen, which shows you the beginning, the middle, and the end after a uh, wolf is felted and leaves. Go ahead and let's run it. <laughs> Are you double straddling? Hello. You missed my quads. I missed your. Did you just have quads? Uh, two hands ago. Is that why you got the really big um, stack I mean, now? I'm still down. I guess yeah. All right. Coming, 45 minutes, 30 minutes to come in hot. So double 575. Okay. 30 minutes? We have an hour left, right? How much time do we have left? 8.35. An hour probably. When do we stop? 9.15? 9.30? 9.15 to 9.30. All right. We start getting better. I got an hour to shut. They, they're pretty hardcore about when they stop. I mean, we can beg and plead and they're, they're like, uh, no. All right, guys, I'm going to do a quick board check. A board check only for 136 Parliament Omaha. If you are in the room interested in playing 136 PLO, give me a wave on our card game. Jimmy for 136 PLO. Stretch for 136 PLO. Stretch, you want? 29, 25. You got that? Yeah. Brian for 136 PLO. You didn't win. Did you pay me? Yeah, well, you paid me. Yeah, you paid him. Oh, I owe you yeah. 50 bucks for the flop. Okay. I never paid you. Brian for 136 PLO. Brian, are you here for 136 PLO? Gene for 136 PLO. Gene, are you here for the 136? So I was gonna do. Mm. Let me see. Let me see. Is that, can I see? You got me covered. Yeah, I started with twenty-five. See so the twenty-five behind. Wait, do you have those silver? Yeah. Did you not know? I did not know. Mm. Oh wow. Um. I don't know if this is anything on here or not. I'm sorry. I, I, like, should, I did not know you had this. Yeah. Or, I, I don't know. I don't know what to do. I, I'll, I, I don't know what the legal ruling is. I don't think you Tell have an option, but I think that's... I don't, also don't know if it's fair. Uh, fuck, I don't know what to do. Because... You have a question. Jim's right behind you. Like I don't know. Like, I mean, if I know you have 10 more, that's like double your yeah. stack. I don't know. <laughs> well... Where were they? They were right here. But were they I had them the whole time. I should have said something or put them out there. I'm sorry. I like obviously wasn't trying to angle you at all. No, you know? no, I did not know. Yeah, I just you know move my stack around. I'm left-handed, and I, I'm sorry. Um, I don't know what to do because it's like if we rolling edge, you have them. I mean, if we just like if you just call and we run our equity, it's like unfair to him. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. But at the same time, it's like unfair to him that you know he puts in. Right, guys, yeah, but he could ask for a chip though. Yeah, situated? but I mean, yeah. That happened to me the other day, same thing. <sighs> he didn't see the great chip. Yeah, I didn't see the Yeah, yeah I mean, I thought he had JoJo had all the chips. Like, Rita? I didn't know he had 20, like, well, JoJo had all the big ones. Yeah, and it's also, 
the drama. So, I mean, I, I don't know what to do. Like, I don't I know if there's, there's, he, there's like the legal ruling is he has to shove in this spot. Yeah. He didn't know I had these chips. And then I just saw you like, put it, like I thought, yeah, and then I just seen, that's and why I asked, like, like did you have them? It was kind of like, my fault because they were here and like, I had just won these and put them here and. I, I didn't know you had them And there he didn't the know I had time. them and so he shoved, but he, he went all in for 10K more than, you know, yeah, basically double the Yeah, I was like 15,000, so like, I, I don't, but yeah, I mean, if it's a I'm like trying thing. to help you, but I don't know what is legal or fair. I mean, we always want you to keep your big chips out front. Yeah, it's probably my fault, but if I make a deal with you, then I don't know if that's allowed, you know, it's like. Between you guys, your heads up. Let's ask him if he minds. Would you mind if we like did something? Because I mean, I thought like, he had like fifteen thousand. Well, I mean, what are you trying to do? Like, I don't over know. Jam I don't even know what thirty thousand. Just, I don't even want to discuss it if you are like really tilted. But at the same time, I don't want to be unfair to him. I don't even know what I'm gonna. I don't know. I'm not gonna say anything about my hand or whatever. I thought you had like ten to fifteen thousand. So I was playing like according to that stack. Uh, I mean, it changed. Like, I don't know. It changed how I play the hand, but it's up to you. Hey, that. Did you I don't know. I, don't, I, don't, I didn't know, but like I, I don't know. You so, but you still good with it, or you want something to change? Because it's just because he has to be conscious enough to you know, stack. I don't want to say that. I'm just trying to offer something fair. I don't want to like. We should make it. What the ruling is, I mean, it is. All right, what it is. Then, that's all right. right. Yeah. then I guess that's. But I can care less what y'all do. If that's all right. I mean, if I have to make I mean, a straight ruling, have to be you're all in. Guys, do whatever you want to do. I, I don't oh, care. So yeah, if if they're in play, I, I don't do care. I, want to do. I mean, you, they're kind of. I mean, that's my fault. So yeah, I just you know, I'm trying. Like I don't want any bad blood. Do whatever you want to do. Because it's kind of my fault. I hit him. I didn't hide him, but it's my fault that you didn't see them in a way. Both yeah, of our I didn't faults. Know, yeah, I mean, I think I, there's mutual I, faults. So I, I want to make sure that you and I are like not. <clears throat> No bad blood after the hand is my biggest goal. I don't really care. I'm just saying, from my perspective, I was playing it from that I didn't see those yeah. two silvers, he and that's he how was I was playing for that. Like, like 8K. Ah, for like, yeah, like I know you had like between 10 and 15 or whatever, and so I was goal. playing accordingly. But or yeah, I have 10. Yeah, yeah. whatever. Well, it's friendly. I mean, it's, it's, it changes it's, a lot. It's friendly. I know you have 20. You know, let them do what they want. Bro, I mean, someone is going to just keep talking about it. Someone's going to make decisions. Well, let them do what they want. Alex, it's let up to you. I was playing accordingly that you didn't have those, but it's up to you because I mean they were on the table. I so it's up to you. Okay, I don't know if it's gonna affect my decision. I haven't really thought that much about the hand. So okay, you can think. I'm about willing the hand. to do. Oh well, okay, I don't I'm care. Call. <laughs> okay. So I'm playing an all-in from this amount. The whole okay. pickle. I don't know if it's gonna affect my decision that much. Um, so do you have me covered now? Like, because I have um, nine. I, 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 have to, I haven't even thought about the hand to be honest. So I just want to. See. This is twelve. This is ten. So that's twenty-two. <laughs> I have nine. No, this is ten. I started with like twenty-five. Twenty. So I have twenty. One. Where's my, where's That's my, right where's there, my drink, son? You got all the orange on top. You're slipping. Oh. That's uh. No, this is twenty. I wasn't the one oh, order. Right, 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 right. No, 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 no. Ten. ten. That's. This is you got there, man. Ten, 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 twenty. Right, right, right. Twenty. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Twenty-one. Bonus. Three hundred. Me. Yeah. You and you have me, you have more? I have you covered then, yeah. You have, you have me, have 21. Me yeah. I don't away, no. I'm like too tired. I guess this is a tune-up spot, he, like you, you know, right? we've been waiting to get in. What? This I did one time for you. Someone, uh, I can't hear. This one's like 200. I don't know, I think we should give him more time. Probably about like, the he, yeah. I'm too tired. So could you? I'm right now, of course it's still on sex appeal. I'm too tired, but like you told her, you're pretty much calling it. Now I actually have to think about the fucking hand. I just didn't want you to think I was like angling at her. Okay. Yeah, I, uh, thing going I on here. I didn't see really I was gonna do something. That happened to me with um JoJo the other day. We were playing cash game. I put them all yeah, in. That is what it is. And he and he said, Oh, right? I would have never done it. Yeah. And he had all the big shit behind him and he just kept piling them piling more on. They were it's like, kind of sick because I'm for sure calling ten K. But that's my fault, I should have to count. You know, might get away with this one. But when you see it, you make a move. 8K and like it's... <laughs> 21K. Like baby did. <laughs> Were you really going to do that? Yeah. I was. Oh, yeah. I made my decision once you, like, think about my decision. I made a full sample. Okay. Okay. So, is it reasonable for me to call time now? Or what? I mean, we've been sitting here for six minutes, bro. 
Well, sorry that now time doesn't play in perfect. This is sick. I'm discounting a lot of hands here because of how you, how, how you acted, which you might act the same way with with those hands too. But just because you're the wizard. Damn, he gets respect too, man. That's, they give this kid respect. That was me. They would have called already, man. You know? Don't he gets respect. Yeah. <laughs> There's this is a, one of the weirdest hands I've ever played. Sorry, I'm taking so long. I mean, I called time four times and there's still not. I mean, that's fine. That's fine. Oh, we got a 50, 100, 200 after this. Yeah, good. Diamond Dave, Benny, got? Sam, the 50, master. 50, 100? 20 foot 50. Yes. No, 50, 100, 200. Oh, that's out of my league. I might put you in for a little taste if you stay out of my oh, way. You want to put me in? If you stay out of my way. Don't make moves on me like you do. Yeah. I mean, no. pretty much. Oh, this is a star next to him. He's all in. It's all in the car. Big league. Oh, oh yeah? Oh, you like that? You like that? Oh, he gets me? On me? Yeah. Oh, what do you On me, he bluffed me. Yeah. Which time? No. Oh yeah, he had me beat. I had nine seven. He had king queen. I seen it. How are you, buddy? I had nine seven. Off. I had I had biscuits. Did he have something? Yeah, he had a right. oh. Such a fucking weird hand. All right, now nah, my hand. What? Do you, my hand's not that good. Yeah, that's what I thought. I, that's honestly, why, like, I'm not doing that if I knew you had that extra ten. That's why. This is a fucking like, crazy hand. I mean, I, I feel call. bad. I, I don't know if I lose or win. Oh, I lose or win. Do you have a pair? I called you. You're good. Wow, this was good as you. Yeah. Wow. That would be wild. Like, that's why like, I didn't know you had that extra ten, or else like I'm that's all just over jam. That's why I offered you a deal. Like I. No, and then they uh, were totally like all complaining, and you. that's why like I I was playing for that. Like I thought you had thirteen. Yeah. It's like that's why I wanted you to be fair. Like I didn't even think about what I was gonna do. Like, and I didn't I know you had you a deal. So weak like, when you did that, you can fall. Yeah, but that's why like, I was like trying to be fair. It's a lot of money. I mean, bro, you understand? You know what I mean? Like, I'm saying if someone should just make a yeah, yeah, yeah. Stick to it instead of being around the bush about it. Yeah, I know. No, but I'm not like no, you're not being a dick. I just wanted to understand. Like, we're playing poker at the end of the day. Yeah. Rules are rule. I'm gonna make the best decision yeah. for twenty thousand dollars. I'm gonna <laughs> yeah, have absolutely. to make a profitable decision. No, it's fine. But like, I really right. tried to like. I thought I had the best hand because I thought. No, it's fine. If you think I have less, you're more likely to bluff. So that's why I wanted to say that ahead of time. But at the same time, you could have had aces, and I could have been fucked too. You know. I'm there. Is this seriously the last hand? Does Don no, about twenty thousand last hand? Not for us, right? Pretty close. After that twenty minute hand. I'm really sorry. For whatever my part in that hand was. That's really fucking crazy. We got a half an hour, forty five minutes. What are we playing after? Twenty five. Fifty, hundred. Great. Nice hand. Nice call. Yeah, I think. I mean, thanks. Yeah. You screwed yourself, I think. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I could just fold. I just thought he. You almost got me off it. I mean, I'm snap calling ten k. Like that was easy if. Oh, he has me. I had 21, 250. Oh, yeah, plus the bet. Yeah. 21 more. That happened to me with JoJo. How about that? He had all the chipping on. Played eight hours and still have the number right. Well, I'm not, I mean, I'm going to think about it for 24,000. I'm going to just think about all the. There's a lot to think about in this hand. Like, they, he was like trying to do, like, let's do, like, equity, like, let's. Let's do like uh, I you call and we just find it out. Yeah, but like I was like kind of like in dark. Because no, I was gonna like at least call or like make it. Only call. 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 I'm all in. Call. Thank you. Call. Thank you, Cletus. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> what the hell did you have, Stan? You were gonna do the same thing. You, you should have made him put that baby in there too. 
Oh, he doesn't have a hundred thousand in front of him. Yeah, I'll, yeah, I was gonna do the same thing. If you guys are on that one three six game, please make your way back to table number fifteen. Why don't I get it? Give me you look, Bob. <laughs> hey, I'll uh, give you a piece of me in like a future game if you want to make up for it. If you want it, I don't know. really don't want any bad blood. Like I'll Thank do you. something to try and give you some equity back yeah, yeah. in the future yeah, of my right. career. I mean, I'm winning. This is the end of the hand. Several minutes go by, and as Wolf gets up to leave the table, I again reiterate my offer to give him a piece at face value. Hey, if if you want, like, take my number. I'll give you a piece oh, of me in the game so that you win back today. the money that you lost to me. If you feel comfortable with it. I don't want to, like, needle you, right? It's just like I'm being really sincere. I'll do something as a favor to you because I feel bad about the situation. Okay. Just, it's an open offer. You could find me on social media anywhere. And... Yeah, seriously. Okay, yeah, I'll be around. I mean, I'm not going to... As long as I don't die, you'll, you'll win it back yeah. at some point. And I don't even want to talk about the people making videos. <laughs> yeah, I don't either. Because a couple of them are friends, a couple of them are not, and a couple, one of them thinks that I try to do that. I, I don't even want to talk about the people who made the videos. Yeah, yeah, okay, let's, okay. yeah. yeah. So, but, but here's what I want to say. When this came out, I was not into poker in the poker world. I played poker once a week or and then I started playing the bike in 2016 17 18 whatever I could honestly tell you that when this happened I never saw the hand I saw things in my cursory about it mm -hmm. I saw like but I never watched it cuz I didn't care I wasn't into that I didn't really even probably get it right right okay because it just didn't matter to me now I'm in the poker community now I run a poker show I play poker for a living so now if something like that happened it would be, I would know it I'd know all the details yeah, it's just course. the way it is it's, it's in your lane right yeah it's in, okay exactly so well the first time I watched this hand was four days ago like in <laughs> I, I'm not bullshitting you no, I in totality you. that's the first time and I watched the raw version like everything, right. the before, the during, the after, which doesn't always get shown. Just the hand unedited. Unedited. Right. I watched it, and okay. So I want to preface and say this, look, and everybody knows this when that comes onto the show, whether it's the Robbie situation, she came on, whoever. I ask a question, you give an answer. If I have a follow-up, I ask it. Whatever your answer is, it is, and the reason I say it that way is because people have to understand opinions they the old cliche are like assholes right like everyone has one okay and it's like i i look at it this way i if i'm not in somebody's body and i didn't do or not do the act i don't know for sure and i've said this a million times so i have no dog in the fight about what happened what didn't happen or intentions i'm just going to talk about yeah, the yeah hand, that's for sure okay I mean, ask, but ask i want people to whatever. understand that right so why don't you tell me because I, I watched the hand and I can't break it down in my head exactly. I know uh, the, the fellow Wolf had ace-10, you had ace-queen, you raised pre, he called. After that, if you want to walk me through it and... and I actually think, to be fair, and I, I you know, people are going to be like, <laughs> I haven't seen the hand in a long time either. Yeah. Someone else raised, he called, I three-bet. Is that what it was? Th okay. That, I three-bet out of the big blind with ace-queen, the person that originally raised folded and he uh, back-jammed. And he back-jammed. Right. That was pre- that was pre. Okay. And then it was on me. And then I was counting my stack and it became clear that he re he did not realize I had 10K more than he thought I had. So he thought he was jamming for 10K less. Right, let's say, and I don't remember the stacks and people are going to think it's crazy. But let's say that the jam was for 20K. He thought it was for 10K. Or maybe yeah. it was 25 it was and about it was half. for 15. It, it was right. roughly exactly. without splitting hairs. Right, exactly. So that was the preflop action and the situation. <clears throat> okay, so... The first question I'll ask, and you and you answer it any way you want. You at the time were a pro professional poker oh, player. Oh, absolutely, yes. You know that those need to be up front. Absolutely. What happened? I like it. It was just a mistake. Like this was it's my okay. fault. It was a mistake. Yeah. It's on me. Okay. It's always up to every individual to make sure that their right. big chips are clearly visible to the right. rest of the table. I wasn't aware that they were where they were, and I wasn't aware that he. I mean, he made it obvious that after he shoved. He did not see them, but I wasn't sure. aware that he couldn't see them at the time that he had shoved. Okay. So that was my fault. I and understand. I, I owned that, and I said I was sorry to him. 
Um, at the time, if you watch the tape, I said I was sorry. Uh, I'm going to show, and that's my fault. The unedited tape. Yeah, fair enough. And okay. that's the only one to show. Yeah, and that and that was my fault. So that's my responsibility. I own that completely, and uh, it's. I've been playing poker for 18 years. It's the only time this has happened, and so yeah. it's yeah. obviously okay. Unfortunate that it and was blown up to this on camera. A couple but. points that I noticed in the video, and I'll just run them by you, sure. and you tell me what's true, what's not true, or what you think of it. Um, I know that you did say uh, a few times whatever the ruling is, it is, and I think the floor man by the book rule said it's it's all in. Yeah, before that, though, um, so I didn't think, I thought he was being genuine that he didn't see those chips, right? Yeah, it was apparent he, he was genuine. He was genuine. So I said, look, I'm sorry I didn't know that you didn't see them. We can do whatever you want. And he continued to say, okay, but I didn't see them. I didn't know. I I, if, I, I saw that. I, if he, you did say whatever you want to do. I think I said that twice or three times. Again, I haven't seen the tape in a long time. I don't remember. But yeah. two or three times I said that. So if he would have said to you, hold on, and then go on. If he would have said to you right there, you say, do whatever you want to do. And he would say, okay, let's play without the two silver chips, the 10K. You yes. would have said yes. I would have, but I want to preface that. I don't want to, I don't want to put it on him. At that time, what I could have done differently, and I replay this all the time. I replay a couple hands in my head in my career. One of them's a hand at the final table of... I'm not dodging the question. One of them's a hand at the final table of the WPT where I got it all in with ace-queen against tens, and I got fourth place, and the winner got like 1.4 million, and I got 250K. Replay that hand all the time because I could have flatted, and that's one hand that sticks with me to this day. The other hand is this one, obviously for the obvious reasons, and I wish I would have just said... Why don't we take the 10K back? I said, we can do whatever you want. If he would have said that, I would have said yes. And it would have been binding. Fine. I could have just said, instead of saying, we can do whatever you want, which is the passive way of, like we talked about this NLP. It's the passive way of saying the same thing. Yeah. I should have been assertive and right. said, okay, let's take the 10K back and just run it. Right? right? I would have actually had an easier decision because I had ace, queen, offsuit. I didn't have aces. So I didn't. Right. I it didn't actually, it was easier for me to call it all in if there were 10K less. But I wasn't really thinking about that at the time. I didn't think about the strategy of the hand. I was thinking about like, holy shit, like this guy, you know, yeah. we're in this spot. I should have just said that. That's on me. I could have. Yeah, your hand, ace, queen, offsuit is not an easy call to a shove. Right. And, and it's easy. It's and it's easy. easier being short stacked. It's it's a very clear call. If there's 10K less, I have a very easy call. Um, I should have, like, if I could go back, I would have just said, let's play for 10K less. He says, okay, I call and we run it. I wish he would have, I also wish, and I don't want to put it on him. It's not, you know, he did what he did. I wish he would have said, let's play 10K less, because then I would have said yes, and this never would have happened either. Right. He didn't say it. I didn't say it. I take my responsibility for my part of where my chips were. That's my fault. And I wish I would have just said, like, let's play for 10K less. Right. It would have been so easy. Just like I should have flatted the ace queen out of position at the okay. final table. And, like, yeah, like, and I, just, I did watch him. It's like when I watched the video, I could attest to this in my brain. When I watched the video, I kept saying in my head, fucking ask to play 10k less I, know. I, I was i no to him i'm like i know say it say it quit saying what you're saying you know but i know it wasn't going to change because i know what happened yeah and he didn't and i and i and i saw that and and the floor man did come over and make so the then ruling. then what happened is the someone called the floor i don't i don't remember all the details of like his hand was like 20 minutes someone called the floor or and the floor said well i'm ruling that this isn't all in and then there was protest about that ruling if everyone was talking whatever so the floor said this is all in we continue to kind of talk. Again, I should have just said, hey, yeah, who cares about that? Let's just do this. Again, we're on TV too, so you know, there's the rules or whatever. I didn't say that. He didn't say that. Then someone called the clock, and then the floor ruled the second time it was all in. At that point, I just went with but it. But now you did admit this at the table to, to the point you made about how hard it is with Ace Queen off to make a shift with the 10K more. You did say, and I'm not saying this changes anything at all. But you did say, wow, by the way you're acting, this makes it a little easier for me to call because then you realize his hand was weak. Yeah, like I don't know if he would have said that if he had aces. Right. right? He could have been reverse, like, reverse. Uh, and I thought he was being genuine. Yeah. And I don't think it's even unfair of him to not say anything. Like let's say I'm counting and he has two aces and he realizes the shove is for more. He's like – okay, well, I'm already all in. I have aces. Like, he might just not say anything. What? But, so, like, the fact that he kind of was of course. saying something made, the case for made what it seem hand like was. he was weaker. Yeah. And so it made calling double the amount with ace-queen easier. A little easier. Of course. That's fair. And that, uh, that went fair. into the decision as the floor ruled. And the floor said, hey, you guys are all in. And, you know, 10 minutes had gone by. We didn't come to a resolution. And then I was like, okay, now I have to think about the actual hand. Like, this guy raised preflop. He called. 
And there was a weird hand that happened before where he had flat called an original raise and then back jammed and he had queens. And I think he stacked me or someone else. And so I knew he was capable of having like a strong hand there. And so like, but anyway, he, yeah, like you said, he kind of acted a little weaker. Okay. Fair so, enough. okay. So the hand runs out, you win, he felts. Yes. Okay. So my question to you now is when he gets up, you know, everyone's saying goodbye, whatever, sorry, you're saying whatever. And then you proceed to tell him on the unedited version, hey, look, I'm really sorry that happened. Uh, you know, maybe I'll let you, if you want, you can take a piece of me anytime you want, as many times as you want until you get the 10K back. Well, I didn't say maybe. I said I offered him that. And I said, yeah. look, even more than the 10K, like maybe 20, like, you know, I'm, I'm, I sell, look, I sell 10% of myself on State Kings at no markup for every game I play on The Hustler. Like, you know, I, I do that to this day. Like, I would have done it till he made 20K. Till he made 20K. Okay. But whatever. Like, I didn't cap it. He just didn't say anything about it. Didn't say it. He yeah, he's he like, like he said, let me it. think about it. Yeah, and then I'll he take your take number or whatever. I mean, okay. it's still a fair. Let me see. Yeah. I'll so to this day, so. last question I have then, and then we're just gonna move on. Yeah. Okay. My fine. last question I have. Well, two questions I have. One is, uh, when you were telling him that if you were going to give him a piece of you to get his 10k or 20k back, which would have come out of your pocket, right. why wouldn't you just give him the 10k and just say, you know what, fuck it, here's the 10k. Yeah. Like. <laughs> you know, if I could just go back and do that and buy back, like none right. of the, it was sure. a lot worse than 10 K in, in stress in my life. But, um, I just thought it like, I just thought at the time it was not fair that I would be all in risking this money. Whereas if I lose, I get nothing. So like, I'm, sure. I have a certain amount of equity when I'm all in on the pot, right? Like I have, let's say it's 50, 50, let's say he has Jackson, it's 50, 50. So like, I'm risking 100% of myself. And then when I win, I'm only winning sure. less than that. I understand So that. like, that's why I think the ideal situation would be if I was more assertive ahead of time and said, hey, let's play for 10K less. I totally get it. Or he was more assertive and said, hey, let's play for 10K less. I just less. wanted to ask. Yeah. And then so afterwards, I thought that was like a fair resolution where it was like, okay, we already kind of both risked this amount of money unknowing the outcome. Because you're right. If he would have won, he would have got... He would have got the 20K. Yeah. So then I'm getting free rolled, which is, you know, he shouldn't yeah. get free rolled. I shouldn't get free rolled. So I said, look, this happened. We were only allowed to run it once. We're on TV. Why don't I do this to also compensate? Instead of the 10K, let's compensate 20K or whatever. And then you get that back. Was it perfect? I don't know. That's, Hindsight. I get it. This is what happened at the time. Yeah. Okay. So how did, after this, done with the hand. Fair enough. How did all the backlash that you just alluded to, what it cost you probably emotionally, Oh my gosh. Um, how did it affect you? How did you handle it? Um, how long did it take you to get through it? You could you could see your demeanor actually absorbing that question because it must have been bad. Uh, what did you go through? I mean, so and I told you this earlier in this session. I put out a video. I was 19 years old. I made a million dollars playing online. Uh, seventh biggest winner in the world. When I was 20, maybe 21, like right around that year, I lost a million dollars back. Right? I went from playing... 200, 400, no limit, $40,000 buy-in. I even played 300, 600, played 60K buy-in to, to 5, 10, and 10, 20, okay? So, like, you're buying in 40K, and then a single raise in that game is my buy-in in the other game, right? That's kind of the delta between where I was playing. Lost a million dollars. That was, like, a lot easier, like, orders of magnitude easier to deal with than, than this was. Because, you know, I could handle, like, you know, if someone's like, you're a bad player, I lose my money. Like poker was never about the money to me. So like, it was always about, you know, being the best and competing at the highest level. Like I was never a rock star, which I would love to be. I was never an NBA player, which I would have loved to be. So this is my Olympics, right? So this is like what I do. I love the process. I love trying to be the best. So like this, like, you know, attack this vitriol from social media, like attack on my character and like me as an individual and like all the negative backlash was like, you know, arguably one of the hardest things I've dealt with in my life. Like, it's not even close. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, like, still, like, it's still, like, a challenge. Like, it's it was really hard. Yeah, I could tell when I even asked you the question and now you're talking. Your demeanor through the whole podcast was up. Yeah. You like, talk extremely fast. <laughs> and I'm a very you, high energy. You're, you're very high positive energy. Positive person. But you look like someone just, you're a balloon and someone just uh, popped you. Yeah, it was really hard because, like, you know, I... I tried to like always be like a, you know, inspiration for other people in poker, like by being, you know, my best version of myself and like being a role model for others and like helping others on their journey and being like a positive source and a good role model for poker and ambassador for poker and like all these roles. And like this thing just like, you know, made a lot of people that don't even know me or anything about me and like just all have a very strong, like heated, attacked, like hatred, I would even use that word, opinion of me. And I got, you know, 
all these attacks on social media and it's just like to absorb i'm a very empathetic person so like if i um i'm in a situation i like absorb the energy of that situation i feel like the, the situation very deeply um so it's very hard for me to like even watch bloody movies or things like that or see needles and stuff like that. i'm just like very empathetic uh, and so like to feel that energy coming towards me on social and whatever was like very challenging. The odd ironic thing is a couple things. I've never had a bad interaction in person. Never once ever. Isn't that amazing? Never. That happens. And I also like when this happened, I was in Italy. I was like on vacation in summer, like, you know, living my life, like whatever. So I was like, <sighs> you know, I dealt with this. And then this was like in June, this was, you know, the, the, the situation happened a year after the hand happened. So like, you know, um, I go back to like poker and I'm thinking like all these like, thoughts in my head, like, you know, going back to the table, like, you know, what, what am I, what am I going to say in this spot? Like, instead of focusing on this, the hand, I'm focused on like, you know, what am I, how am I going to respond? What are people going to say? Whatever. Like never had anything happen in poker, which was like, kind of, I was like, whoa, cause there's all of this energy and attacks on social media. Sure. The other thing that I found very weird and I kind of go back and forth between like, you know, I engage with people on social media. If someone attacks me or leaves me a comment, I'll talk to them and I'll respond to them. I do this with trolls all the time, even if it has nothing to do with this. It has something to do with another thing like that I post about I a different it. subject. Yeah, I get it. And almost always the trolls, they DM me, they leave me a comment. They're saying, they're like, oh, I actually like you or this had nothing to do with you or like, I'm just you know, whatever. And then they're very nice to me once they see that like you're kind to them. Yeah. So that kind of like changed my relationship with the situation too. It's like when it you too. respond to people and you treat them with kindness and like they're a human, which I, I always do, even if someone attacks me or they're mean to me or they call me names, like that's, that's fine. That's on them. I don't take that personally. But, um, that was a really interesting dichotomy dichotomy between like the way that that taught me a lot about society and people and humanity too. Like the way that people act on socials, like they think almost like it occurred to me that the people that a lot of people that were like attacking were like, it seemed as though when we had interactions, cause we would go back and forth with like five or 10 DMS. Some of them even became like members at conscious poker. They would like buy products later in the future. It was like really weird. I've and had, it just I've occurred had the same experience. It just occurred to me that like, they almost didn't even think that they were talking to like you or a human. Like it almost didn't even feel like they were aware that they like they were sending this message to me directly like i was reading all these messages and they were like oh i didn't think you'd read it or whatever i got that response so many times it's crazy and it's like i read all my messages i read all my dms so like yeah it was yeah people don't really understand i always say there's a person behind your words that you're that you're putting it into them or towards them you know it that 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 part's crazy i had i experienced some of that myself exactly what you said about like once you talk to someone it's different did you ever have any of the people that were saying negative things about you that were actually prominent in the poker community ever run into them and have them treat you different? Like, have you ever ran? I don't want to say any names, but you ever run into anyone that was hard on you and then you had a different experience in person? No, but yeah. I also don't like, <clears throat> I don't know if I wouldn't even know like who those people like. Well, I'm who, saying people you know what that I mean? were hard on you that did shows and things. Oh, um, no, but I haven't ran into that many. Then you haven't. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering so. if it was just trolls or, um, yeah, like, People are wondering. I haven't ran into Doug. I haven't ran into Joey. Like, I don't... Again, I yeah. I wasn't even prompting you to say Right, right, right. But, but like, yeah. So I just haven't come across people's no, totally. paths totally. in poker that maybe were hard on me. Sure. Um, but also no hard feelings to other people. I understand where people are coming from. And Was everyone. there anything positive that came out of that experience? And it doesn't have to be. Don't try to... If there isn't, then there just isn't. Like, in some ways, you know... I find in my life, you know, the hardest things I deal with are like the most opportunities for growth, right? And so there's this like ir irony of like, you know, when I when when I'm when I'm living through something that's challenging, or like maybe I don't, you know, maybe people feel this way about losing or downswings or like other things that they've gone through that are challenging in poker or outside of poker. Like those are the things that I find are the most opportunities for growth. And so like, you know, I wish I was a little bit more. Um, like now that I've had this experience happen, if, you know, something like this happened again, I feel like I'd be much more equipped. Of course, to handle it's it. like I wish anything. I, I wish I was more mature too at the time. Like, like anything, just, buddy. You know, and so I think it, it just, yeah, like overall, I'm hesitant to label things as positive or negative because I just try and look at life like sure. a series of events and have non-attachment. It's fair. But it was the most, one of the most challenging things I've dealt with. And, but it mm -hmm. did help me grow. It helped me like learn about people, be more empathetic to people not take things personally was a, another lesson that I had to mm -hmm. internalize. Did it make you a little thicker skin? Yeah, like internalize through this this process too. And also just like where you spend and give your energy. Like before, it was like much more important to me 
and it still is something that I like feel like I genuinely want, you know, I don't harbor any negative emotions towards other people. I don't like hate anyone. Like people say, Oh, I hate this person. I've never, I don't, I don't hate anyone in the world. I maybe disagree with people or I think that we're yeah. operating on different levels and not in a arrogant or way, but just like we see the world differently and that's fine. But like this kind of made me realize that like you can't, um, touch or connect or, you know, be with everyone. And that was, that was like a very hard accepting mm. thing for me. Cause I always yeah. wanted like people to like me. And Everybody. Like, yeah. yeah. Like I wanted to reach everyone. And I realized like, that's not how the world works. Never going to happen. And that that's like been very challenging to accept. Yeah. Have you ever in the time that this happened till now, ever been able to tell this whole thing like you just did? No. You, this is the so first thank time? you for that. I actually no, I wasn't looking that. for a thank you. I was just wondering, yeah. is this no, the no, first but time? I'm being genuine. Like you, first time I, we you didn't, ever we got didn't it plan out. this. So no, like, no. You know. But this, we were going to talk about the hand. That's it. Right. And I wasn't expecting this either to like open up like this, but, um, no, and I've never done this and you know, that's probably my fault too. Like, I think if I maybe was more open about the whole thing, it would have maybe blew off better, but I just, yeah. All right. Well, on to a couple fun questions. Fine. I'll take the fun questions. And we'll get this juju (laughs) off us and then we'll, we'll close. Okay. (coughs) Excuse me. Okay. Stupid question. Favorite poker player idol growing up? Wow. What a question. So I came up in 2003, you know, there was, there were not like poker content, poker content didn't exist. So I read, um, Phil Humless book playing poker, like the pros. And it was very inspirational at the time because he told this story about how he dropped out of college Mm -hmm. with, I think the number was 20 K don't quote me. Maybe it was 30 K and like, you know, he's telling his story of building his confidence and, and how he knew that like poker was right for him. And I, and that like stuck with me to give me some sort of framework for like, okay, if I get to this level by this time, I mean, Phil did it. Like I'm at Phil, not, not that I'm at Phil's level, but like, I'm sure, you know, I have some sort of success. Yeah. It and motivated so I remember, you. It inspired you. And I remember when I was in college, I built up 30 K and I was like, wow, like, you know, that really changed me. And then just like, I always looked up to, you know, the, like Ivy Negreanu, like watching poker yeah. on television. Yeah, the legends. And it was just really surreal to... Like I went hiking with Negreanu one time in Az outside of Monaco. Like I just remember like thinking like, you know, we're playing in the same tournament. We were playing the was 100K together. Was it before together. or after the incident? Before. Uh, I was going to say, I wonder how he would. Yeah, I, hope, I was hoping you say after because he's such a nice guy. I could see him doing it after. Yeah. yeah he's I such mean a it. nice guy. Yeah. Um, and like I just remember like we went out to get a coffee and like we were just like we were playing in the 100K tournament together. And I just remember like. Surreal. This I, I like, you know, you, I ha- you have moments in your career over 18 years where you're like, whoa, like the 16 year old in me, like I would never have imagined this. You know, I remember the first time playing with Ivy and um, we played in a tournament in Monaco and then he didn't even know me or whatever, but really quick. And then we played in the big game together in Macau and we were playing, you know, at Star World, 10K, 20K Hong Kong, 20K, 40K Hong Kong, maybe like, you know, 2K, 5K US blinds. And something came up where they doubled the game. I don't remember all the details, but I just remember the punchline. They doubled the game or something like that. And Ivy's like, oh, don't worry. Like, can I, I'll take a piece of you. And I was just like, I was just like, wow. Like that. I just remember his face and my face. And I remember that line. I was like, wow. Yeah, that's cool. Like that. Yeah. It was touching. Like I just, that was crazy. That is cool. Something familiar to that to me would be like, you know, same as you. I watched, I watched all those names you just mentioned on high stakes poker back in the day. And they're all the OGs, the legends and, you know, come full circle. They're playing on my show. Yeah, and uh, that's so and I wasn't cool. even in poker, and and I'm interviewing him, and so did you see the piece I put out on Phil the other day? No, Ivy. Yeah. Oh no, uh, Helmuth. No, I no. want to see it. I just it it just was like a 12 minute video. Uh, he uh, um, he went through you know our time on the last two streams he was on. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. And so I I just put out a 12 minute video on him. I felt so bad for him, and yeah, and you know because the guy takes it's just incredible. I mean, he asked for a lot of it, but he takes an incredible amount of heat. And uh, check it out. He does. And he's like, you know, we've, we played on Poker Night in America quite a bit together. I had a moment where he was like, you know, nice fold with your set of nines. And that was like another one of those moments that stuck with me. Yeah. But he's always been like a very nice guy and like, seems like a very good guy. Like from what I know about him, like when you go to dinner with him, like, or you, you know, we're playing. It is not the Chinese persona poker. that you see at a right. poker table. Yeah. And it's like just totally really different. Nice guy. And I saw him with his wife too, and totally different, like yeah. just demeanor. And like, seems like a very good guy. He is. Yeah. He is. Uh, I have here. I'll watch that piece too. I want to see. Yeah, it. it's just it's just I I out yesterday it. or day before. Um, uh, what do you? What are your thoughts on why? I always ask everyone this, as I like I like them to talk about it. So why not? Sure. Um, your experience playing on Hustle Casino Live and your thoughts on our rise in a year and eight months, like 
what are your thoughts on that? Why do you think the show has been so successful? This is where I just uh, do a little personal marketing. Yeah, no, and you guys totally deserve it. Um, a couple things. So I came from the bike, and I've been playing on that show a long time. Um, and I remember I think I was there for, for Feldman's first show. And um, that was always an incredible experience. And I remember... We played together a couple times. We played together a couple times. We were playing at Commerce together, you and I. And then yeah. we played on the bike a couple times. And I remember... Feldman told me something. He's like, hey, I have something, you know, like something's happening. I can't tell you yet. And it'll, it'll happen. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Yeah. And then he told me, you know, like early on, like before anything happened, like that they were moving to Hustler, whatever. And I just remember how I felt in the moment. I was with Ambra and we were there. We were at Cafe Gratitude and, and whatever. And I just remember I was like, man, they made a huge mistake. You guys are going to crush it. And I just was so confident, mm. like seeing him rise up and like knew he was partnering with you. And I was just like you guys are going to crush it. Like it was just so obvious to me at the time. And so I remember thinking that and just seeing where you come, like I'm extremely impressed. I'm extremely proud. You guys totally deserve it. But like I saw the trajectory early on that like you guys had all the things that it took yeah. to like, you guys were the show. And um, it's been an incredible experience. You know, for me, like I told you, this is kind of like my, you know, Olympics. This is what like I get on the treadmill for to get excited about. Like I really would have loved to be, I grew up watching basketball. I loved Kobe Bryant. I was in the NLA. I would have loved to be, I'm 5'9", you know, I'm 160 pounds of 5'9". Like, I would love to have been a basketball player. I would have loved to be a rock star. Maybe I still can be, but, um, you yeah, know, and this was know. like my thing. So me playing on the show, Poker Night in America and The Hustler, in some ways it's cooler than playing, you know, a million dollar buy-in game in Macau because it's like, this is our NBA. Like for me, I look at it like this yeah. is my NBA. Yeah. So I'm extremely grateful to play. It's like an incredible experience. I don't take any of it for granted. Yeah. Um, it's amazing. Like it's... Yeah. Guys, I don't do this often enough, but if you love this show, hit the like button and more than anything, subscribe to this channel so I can keep giving you this content. Subscribe now. Well, you know, I've said this before on one of my shows in passing, but I'll, I'll tell you because you may not know, um, you know, with, with just fast forwarding all the nonsense of how Ryan and I got together to do this, um, they, the bike wasn't thrilled with some of the things going on over there and when Ryan was going to leave, um, management there, portion of the management there, uh, we were in talks with them mm. to Ryan and I taking over the show. Okay. Yeah. And it, we were this close and then COVID hit and everyone just kind of, uh, and I think Stones might have happened at the time. I remember something. Stones. That's true. I think true, it was it right then, right? And that was coming yeah. up. So they got a little panicked and they didn't know what they wanted to do. They wanted to see how it was going to settle. So they put everything on the burner. And, um, and I can only say it this way because of the management there and because of the management at the hustler and the difference and the ability to do what we were doing here, which we wouldn't have the ability to do there. I know for sure it goes back to the term unanswered prayers because I really wanted that gig. I wanted to take over that show mm. and, um, and it didn't work out because of circumstances, the two that I told you about. And I'll tell you what, I, uh, I thank my, I thank God every, every time I get a chance for that blessing because yeah. it literally would have changed the whole trajectory of what Ryan and I are doing. So that's sometimes life's a game of inches like that, you know? Yeah. And it's also like, I look at it, I look at it like that too. Like when I want something, you know, subjective to happen, right. Yeah. Or something that I have that I'm projecting out and I'm like, this is what I want. If it doesn't happen, I look at it like, okay. You know, you have two ways to react to it. You can look at it like, oh, that's so bad and label it as negative. Or you can be like, well, maybe there was a reason and this is leading me in a different direction where like with you, like the no at the bike was maybe devastating in the beginning, but then it like led to this where it's like, this was the right totally. thing. So I try and keep that framework of like, okay, if this is no, like the, the world, the universe, God, whatever you want to call it, they're like nudging me, you know, totally. over here to go in a different direction. So I could just kind of flow downstream, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of how yeah. I think about things. Yeah. Uh, do you have a favorite hand? You know, I guess probably like Jack Ten of Diamonds, you know, it's yeah. just like a sexy hand. A I mean, hand. I, I think like the, you know, it's, nobody ever says aces. <laughs> no, know? I know. Right. Because <laughs> I ace. mean, let's face it. You'd rather have aces. Yeah. Yeah. But at the same time, aces, you know, you got, you know, you're going to be committed to the hand. Jack Ten, I feel like I'm not committed to this hand, but if I am committed, 
it's good for me. Whereas yeah, aces, yeah. you're like, I'm committed and it I'm might not yeah. be good. <laughs> and then you're just going to overplay them. Right. And like, yeah. so Jack-10, I, I feel like you don't get in I too much aces. trouble. I just overplay them and lose and I don't know what yeah, to do with them. That's why I like those hands like that where it's like, you don't get in too much trouble, but if you're in a big pot, it's because yeah, you, 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 you want to be. It's because you want to be, not because you, you have be. to be. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, favorite food? Oh, man. That's tough. Whatever... I like whatever my wife and her family are cooking, to be honest. <laughs> right. But Italian food, I'm super Italian you know, food, yeah. blessed. Like we have amazing food. By the way, in, I met, in our area. I met, I met your mom. Uh, the last one of the streams you're at. What a nice lady. Yeah, Gosh, she's great. Damn, she's super nice. supportive. She's so cool. Yeah, very uh, positive. Do you have a favorite hobby besides poker? Yeah, well, that wouldn't be a hobby. No, poker is not a yeah. hobby. Um, I like creating things. So I like to be at the beginning of a project mm -hmm. and making that come to life and happen. And um, I can't share too much, but I'm doing hopefully something in music that I have recently. Oh, maybe you'll be a rock star. Can you sing? I so in high school, um, like I said, I didn't make football. I dropped out. I dropped out of football. Didn't make basketball. So my uh, older stepsister at the time was in musical theater and choir. So I joined because it was like I saw her social circle and all these positive things she had uh, through that experience. And I was like, you know, that would be cool. So I did this. I was unable to sing at all at the time. Took voice lessons for four years. And uh, my senior year of high school, I won best singer in in, oh, no in high school. So I was in musical theater. I played Javert and Les Miserables. If anyone watches musical theater, um, and so that was like super meaningful, incredible experience. But then, of course, I started traveling. I wasn't in Orange County to take voice lessons. I started like getting all involved in poker. I kind of stopped, and um, I realized like that's a big part of my life that I really loved and that like a cool way to express I myself. I could see you at a Starbucks sitting on, sitting on a stool and uh, belting out some tunes. <laughs> that would be good. I really would prefer to be like <laughs> Billy Joe Armstrong I understand. Green Day. I, that was I a would joke. much rather be a rock yeah, star. No, I, I, that, but, was, uh, that was a joke. But. That's something I would like to take back up. Like music. <laughs> well, sometimes you know these guys start at Starbucks. Yeah, that's true. You can't true. just go to the big stage, man. Yeah, that's You got to open for no, someone, bro. No, but I'm saying like my genre. You got to like, open for the latte being a rock star would yeah. be cool, man. All right. Yeah. Um, you have any poker goals that you need to accomplish? No, not okay. really. I'm grateful for everything. I mean, I you know, the 16-year-old in me would want to win the main event, but I'm not going to put my life goals on something that I totally. can't control. But, like, that's, you know, the you, other you bucket list items. I've you wouldn't done. hate winning I the main. I wouldn't hate the main. But I don't even play that every year. That's the stupid thing. No, I, play I hear like you. Once Either every three I. years. Yeah. yeah. Any life goals, the thing you want to accomplish in your life outside of poker that you're just dying beside, well, being a rock star. Being a rock star would be cool. I mean, I'd really <laughs> like, you know... The, the, I'd like to be able to like move the arc of where people are seeing poker and its place in the world and society as from a game of like, you know, randomness and chance and luck to like a game of incomplete information with an element of luck, but predominantly based on skill. And so I'd like to help people be able to make better decisions through the game of poker in life and business, but also like to change the the place and relationship that poker has in society yeah. more towards a game that's respected as some of the things we talked about today of what it takes to really achieve um, things at the highest levels in poker and what the people at the, at, that are competing at the highest levels are going through to achieve these results and to move it towards a game that's more respected and loved by people around the world. That's great. Yeah. Thank All you. All right. I'm going to, yes, I'm going to give you a final thought. You have anything you want to leave anyone with. You don't have to, if not, we'll just close it right here. No, I mean just other than like, I mean, I'm very active on social media, like on Instagram, Twitter, and just consciouspoker.com. I read all my emails. Like if you opt in and respond to the email, it goes sure. directly to me. I read sure. it. I read all my DMs like we talked about earlier, for better or worse. Yeah. Uh, so I'm very like active on social. Um, come say hi. Like I'm happy to chat with any of you guys and like get to know you or yeah. help out on anyone's poker journey. Uh, it's I'm always grateful for the opportunity to do that. So. Well, I'll tell you, this was an interesting interview. I yes. appreciate you coming down. Thank you for this. Uh, I this really, really do cool. appreciate it. Uh, okay, there you have it. Thanks, guys. Alec Torelli, I am Nick Fertucci, and this is the Nick Fertucci Show. <laughs> Envy out. See ya. That was cool, man. Yeah. <laughs>